Good morning. Before we begin, I will go over the emergency response plan for this room. In an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery take direction from security to evacuate. Council takes direction from the meeting clerk to evacuate. After evacuating the room, please proceed to a stairwell. Take the stairs to ground level and evacuate the building through the doors marked emergency exit and go to a muster point. Do not take an elevator or walk through the city room. Anyone with limited mobility should identify themselves to security or the meeting clerk during an evacuation. Finally, please speak with security or the meeting clerk if you require first aid. Thank you. We are live from council chamber. Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. It's nice to see some members of public joining us in the, uh, in the chamber hall. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of TD6 territory and Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nkura, Su, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Uh, I will do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. Thank you. Adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I'll move adoption of the April 2nd City Council public hearing meeting agenda. Need a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Uh, any protocol items? I see none. And explanation of the public hearing. The clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with. I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council members will select the bylaws that they wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion. Council will then deal with each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. For each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Those in favor will speak first in panels, followed by those opposed in panels. Each person will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, then yellow when there is one minute remaining, and flash red when the five minutes are up. If you're participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you and or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. After all questions of administration have concluded, I will ask council if they wish to ask any further questions of those who presented in the response to new information that may have arisen during the public hearing. Thereafter, council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. If you're participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you're here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it is your turn to speak. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. CD staff will direct you to your muster point. Now I will go to uh, uh, clerk. May you please call the bylaws. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. 
Items 3.1 and 3.2 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, bylaw 20785, to amend the Goodridge Corners Neighborhood Area Structure Plan? And item 3.2, charter bylaw 20786, to allow for institutional services, community services, or recreational activities, Goodridge Corners. We have in favor Chris Davies to answer questions only. Davies Consulting joining remotely. Chris, are you there? Hi, good morning. Thank you. And no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, Charter Bylaw 20783, to allow for a range of small scale housing ELSAs? Uh, we have in favor Keith Davies to answer questions only Stantec, sorry, in person. Yeah. Uh, and Elise Shillington to answer questions only also in person. Nice to see you both. And no one is in opposition, and uh, Elise is from Kentero. No one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 20784, to allow for a range of small scale housing and a school slash park site, ELSIS? Uh, in favor, we have Keith Davies to answer questions only. Stantec uh, is here, and Elise Shillington to answer questions only. Kentero is here. Uh, and no one is in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.5, Charter Bylaw 20789, to allow for smaller scale parks and amenities, Mayo Cumin? Uh, in favor, we have Ryan Kerstiak to answer questions only from City of Edmonton, joining remotely, and no one is in opposition. May we confirm that we have Ryan online? I'm oh, here. Good Ryan morning. There? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Items 3.6 and 3.7 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.6, bylaw 20791, to close a portion of road right of way, Anthony Henday South, and item 3.7, Charter Bylaw 20792 to allow for development that includes a stormwater management facility, Anthony Henday South. Uh, we have in favor uh, Adonis Dishoso, Dishos, 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 right? To answer questions only, City of Edmonton? Yes, here. You there? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And uh, Holly. Mackelson from Stantec. Uh, yeah, good morning. Thank you. Uh, Nat Alapi to answer questions only from Stantec. Good morning, I'm here. Yolanda Liu to answer questions only from Stantec. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. And Holly, you're to answer questions only as well, if selected? Uh, I have a presentation if needed. If needed, if selected, right? Got yes. it, okay, no one is in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.8, Charter Bylaw 20787, to allow for agricultural and rural use, uses, Gorman? Uh, we have in favor Vinod Bhartwaj. Questions only. Phoenix Company joining us in person. Oh, here you are, Vinod. Nice to see you. Uh, and no one is in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.9? Charter Bylaw 20794 to allow for a greater variety of row housing products, Blatchford. In favor, we have Tom Lumsden to answer questions only from City of Edmonton. Joining remotely, Tom, you there? Yeah, good morning. Thank you. And Om Joshi to answer questions only, WSP Canada Inc. Om. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And no one is in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 20788, to allow for a variety of commercial businesses, Malmo Plains? We have in favor Greg Dulings, Dooling to answer questions only. Uh, Greg, you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And Yolanda Liu from Stantac. Yolanda is there. Good morning. Thank you. And no one is in opposition. 
Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to 3.11 Charter Bylaw 20790 to allow for smaller scale parks and amenities, Otwell? Uh, in favor, we have Ryan Kerstiak to answer questions only from City of Edmonton. Ryan is already here. No one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.12, Charter Bylaw 20793, to allow for the comprehensive redevelopment of a large site into a primarily residential development supporting a variety of built forms, Woodcroft? We have in favor Brian Murray from BNA joining remotely. Brian, you're there. Good morning, Mayor. Thank you. Rob Apple, Appleyard to answer questions only. Brentwood Community Development Group joining remotely. Rob, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Catherine Oberg to answer questions only. Bunt and Associates joining remotely. Good morning, Mayor Sohi. Thank you. Trent uh, Letwinik to answer questions only. Gravity Architecture, joining remotely. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Shauna McKinnon, to answer questions only. Tool Design, joining Good morning. remotely. Thank you. Omar, yeah. Ab sorry. Omar Abdel Jaffer, to answer questions only. Alpin Martin Consultants, joining remotely. Good morning, Mayor. Thank you. Anna Moore, to answer questions only. BNA, joining remotely. Good morning. Thank you. And in opposition, we have... Um, Summer Dillon uh, in person. There you are. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Denise Ennis, Ennis joining remotely. Denise, we'll check back. Thank you. Items 3.13 and 3.14 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to items 3.13, bylaw 20727, to amend the central McDougal slash Queen Mar Mary Park area redevelopment plan, and item 3.14, charter bylaw 20728, to allow for temporary surface parking until December 31st, 2028, central McDougal. In favor, we have Yolanda Liu to answer questions only. And uh, Tim Shipton, Oilers Entertainment Group, joining remotely. Tim, are you there? Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And Fabio Gorducci to answer questions only. Kate's Group, joining remotely. Yeah, group. Thank you. And in opposition, Michael Brown, Central McDougal Community League and Victoria Manor Condo Corp. Michael, are you there? Warren Champion, Central McDougal Community League, joining remotely. Warren? Nope. Uh, that is it. All right, now selections. Here we go. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will select 313 and 314. And 13. Um, I will also select 3.3. .3. Just a few quick questions on that. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I would like to select 3.1 and 3.2, similar. Just a couple quick questions. Yes, ma'am. 3.1, 3.2? Yeah. And then I would like to select uh, 3.12. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Solhi. I would like to select 3.6 and 3.7. That's really together. Seven. Okay. Uh, so we have selected 3.1, 3.2, Councillor Rutherford, 3.3, Councillor Stevenson, 3.6, 3.7, Councillor Rice, uh, 3.12, Councillor Rutherford, 3.13, 3.14, Councillor Stevenson. 
can someone move the balance, please? So, Councillor, sorry, no, 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 hold it, hold it. I'm making another mistake. Councillor, I'm going to go to Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning, Mayor Sohi. I will move closure of the public hearing on items 3.4, 3.5, 3.8, 3.9, 3.10, and 3.11. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay. Uh, please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move first reading of the aforementioned items. Second. Thank you. Please vote. We have 13 votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of the aforementioned items. Second. Thank you. Please vote. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of the aforementioned items. Second. Okay, please vote for uh, consideration. We have 13 votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20784, Charter Bylaw 20789, Charter Bylaw 20787, Charter Bylaw 20794, Charter Bylaw 20788, and Charter Bylaw 20790. Second. Okay. Thank you. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Councillor Cartmill and Councillor Rice. Uh, now we go into um, first item, which was 3.1, bylaw 20785 to amend the Goodridge Corners Neighborhood Area Structure Plan, cross-referenced with Charter Bylaw 20786 to allow for institutional services, community services, and recreational activities, Goodridge. Center. So that's 3.1. Uh, no one is in opposition to this. So, Councillor Rutherford, do you have questions to the proponent uh, or to administration? administration? Administration. Okay. And there's, do you need a presentation from administration? No. Anyone else needs a presentation from administration? No. All right. So then uh, no questions to uh, Chris Davies. Uh, then we'll go to questions to administration. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, just a few quick questions. Just one, um, I noticed in the report where it said that the the notified community organizations, it says Cumberland Oxford Community League and Castle Downs Rec Society. Um, I wanted to know if it was just an oversight for Baturn Community League because Rapperswil and Canosa are both uh, represented by Baturn. I'll have to check that. We, we go off the list that um, applies to each of the areas, so I'll double check that those are included. Yeah, in I the wanted list. to flag, like, I don't think this is yeah. a big, this is a big rezoning in terms of uh, those leagues, but I know there's a few coming up with Goodridge Corners, but I don't want Baturn to be Baturn. missed on that. Yeah. Sorry, and it's Baturn Community League? Yeah, Baturn Community League. So uh, the, the City Hall, is, the, the Community League is in Tastawinawak, but they represent. Rapper's Will and Good and um, Canosa, which are just south of Goodridge Corners. Perfect. Thank you very much, Councillor Rutherford. Okay. And then I just had one other question. Um, I had done a motion on May 5th talking about bringing back proposed amendments to Goodridge Corners Neighborhood Structure Plan, um, identifying broader city goals and opportunities. And I was just wondering. Where is this that work in in the context of this application? 
It's still underway. We haven't received the application for that one yet, but I do know that it is underway by the applicant. But this doesn't affect this parcel in any way. That wouldn't change. Okay, correct. So just wanted to double check. And so we don't have a timeline yet for when that would be coming back? I do not have a timeline, no. Okay. That is all my questions. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much, Councilor Rutherford. Any other questions from colleagues? Seeing none, at this information, I'll ask if council members have any questions on the uh, uh, new information arising out of the previous conversation. Seeing none, we are ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Councilor Rutherford. Yeah, I'm happy to move uh, the closure of the public hearing on this item. These items, 3.1 and 3.2. Second. Councilor Stevenson seconded. Okay. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. I'd like to move first reading okay. of bylaws 3.1 and 3.2. Second. Thank you. Please vote. Sorry. So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Anyone to speak? No one to speak. Okay, not to vote. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Yes, yes, yes. I'll move second reading of 3.1 and 3.2. Second. Thank you. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. I will move consideration of third reading on items 3.1 and 3.2. Second. Okay, please vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. And I will move third and final reading of bylaw 20785 and 20786. Second. Thank you. Please vote for the final readings. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. So we dealt with 3132. Now we are moving on to 3.3 Charter Bylaw 20783 to allow for a range of small scale housing. Alsis, selected by Councillor Stevenson. Uh, okay. Councillor Stevenson, do you need a presentation? I do not. I just have a few questions of administration. Okay, then uh, any questions from Council to the uh, folks in favor? I see none. Then we'll go to Councillor Stevenson to questions to administration. Thank you very much. Um, appreciated the report. I, I guess I was just confused or just wanted to better understand um, some of the rationale for, for supporting this rezoning. Uh, the report speaks to increasing housing diversity because there's more housing options within that zone. Um, but it seems to me that, that it actually increases the, the amount of the neighborhood that has the same zoning as other parts of the neighborhood. It becomes much more highly RSF. So just wondering if that, that is achieving our, our goals around housing diversity. Thank you for that question, Councillor. Um, it is correct that the RSF zone provides that flexibility for housing diversity. Um, but from a land use perspective, the rezoning, we look at land use compatibility. The RSF zone is a compatible zone to the zones around it. And the plan calls for low density street oriented type development. So while it is still RSF, the build form based on what the plan is calling for will be street oriented. And, and how is that assured? Like, I guess, when is RSF not street oriented? 
Council, there are, there are assurances that we look further on in the, in the process, which is a time of subdivision. So we work closely with that group to ensure we're getting the type of built form that the plan envisioned, which is the street-oriented product. Uh, so that would be like, are, are we talking just about front, front driveways or what do we mean by street-oriented? Uh, we're, we're talking about more um, landscaping and um, uh, what do we say, walkways to the house up front, not rear garages and lanes and things like that. Okay, I think I think the other question just comes down to to overall neighborhood density. I guess I guess where I'm struggling is that it seems that the the low that the street oriented designation in the plan is somewhat meaningless if if we are allowing RSF, uh, given that we're allowing RSF for the just the regular low density. Yes, we've uh, we we were aware of that concern, and uh, we do have another as I said another checkpoint at time of subdivision. We work closely with that group to ensure we are getting that built form that the plan does en did envision. So we've got this bit of a, a gap right now with the, with the zones, the new zones that came in. Yeah. Uh, but we do have a kind of a certainty going forward at, uh, at the next stage. Okay, and so, so would part of that check, because I think the other, there's the, the built form, there's also just the density, right, and achieving the overall density. So would that also be something that is considered at um, subdivision in terms of the width of the lots? It is, yes, yeah, and that we're still getting about 45 units per hectare with this kind of zoning in, in this situation where we, can, uh, where we can check it. And and subdivision would allow us to require that? Yes, yeah. correct. Okay, okay, that's very helpful. That's really good to know. Um, and then just in terms of, uh, there's a reference to some of the other neighborhoods where this has been employed, uh, Chappelle, Chappelle, Edgemont, the Orchards, and have we done... Um, that sort of retrospective look to, to see that the neighborhoods are achieving 45 net residential? We have, and we're, we're continuing to do that as we see these new zones coming into play, mm. very much so. So we are aware that we are getting uh, the high densities and the, the empirical evidence does, does suggest that as well. Is supporting that. Yes. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. That That is good to know that there's another checkpoint at subdivision, and so the subdivision plans will need to adhere to the, the plan direction. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I had flagged this one, too, in, in reviewing the public hearing agenda. Um, can you break down the subdivision application section for someone that's a little bit more non- uh, are familiar with that because I do I am concerned with the guarantee of a minimum density being removed and from my understanding with you know public hearings we need to think about every ex wh what is permissible within that zone on either extremes right yes and mm -hmm. and I'm I am concerned that that whole neighborhood is now very much you know the low density um, yeah. So yeah, no, no, those are those are good concerns, and the, the points that we also um, we also look into um, the reviewing agencies, uh, the, the planners. There's an overlap between the land use planning work we do and the subdivision group as well. So we work hand in hand. Yeah. We pass them off to them. We work closely. They know what's coming next. We do see the subdivision as part of these rezoning applications as well. So we are looking at that when the application when the application is submitted. We're looking to see what kind of built form is going to be proposed, and does it conform with the plan? And in this case, yes, it does. So, Councillor, just to add, but it, but it does it conform with the plan because we're changing the plan. Like this is this, this includes a neighborhood structure plan amendment. So yes, it conforms to. Or my. Sorry, this one is just the rezoning. Okay, I see. So there's no plan amendment here, but okay. but they have to conform to that plan that's in place which okay. is street-oriented residential, which again is insured through the built form. And we then we have minimum, um, we would still have regionally those minimum uh, population per hectare requirements. Uh, unit projection. Yeah, per sorry, hectares, unit, yes. unit. Yeah, and, and again, we, we've been monitoring it a lot, lot closer. Yes. We're looking at the new terms of reference. And we are seeing the densities come up in all instances, but in this case, we also we also see the built form that will come up to about forty five units per hectare. Okay, okay, that that provides some assurance. Um, yeah, that helps. And can I? Um, bef I'm done with administration, but I would like to ask one question to the applicant. If we can come back to that, thank you. 
All right. So, any other questions to administration? Seeing none, now we'll ask council members if they have questions to anyone on the new information arising out of the previous conversation. So, Councillor Rutherford, you have some questions to the applicant. Yeah, just based on the conversation with administration, what is the need or desire to do this rezoning? What, what, what benefit, what kind of flexibility, what does that allow you to do in terms of built form yeah. from what is currently zoned? Thanks, Councillor. Um, <clears throat> so under the current zone, um, there's an allowance for a rear setback of five and a half uh, meters. Uh, in the RSF zone we're proposing, the rear setback can be down to 1.2 meters, and that's important because um, on a couple of the blocks in the plan, there are only 25 meters of depth. Uh, so to provide a townhouse product, which Cantero is actually providing um, all townhouses in the area at about 54 units per hectare, um, that's why the zoning is proposed. Yeah. yeah. It's really the setback piece. That's yeah. the... So we're looking to build shallower towns with a rear attached garage. So it's okay. actually a higher density product that we used to have to build under a DC1 that's now allowed under RSF, oh. but not allowed under RSM. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. That helps clarify. That's that's all my questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Any other questions, uh, Councillor Stevenson? No. No. Okay. All right. Close to the public. Uh, okay, Councillor Stevenson. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I'll move closure of the public hearing. Okay. Second. Okay. All right. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move first reading of item 3.3. Need a second. second. Councilor Rutherford. Okay, we have first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Uh, seeing none, anyone, uh, Councillor Stevenson to close? Sure, very briefly, just thank you to the applicants for being here this morning and thanks to administration for, for walking us through that. I think, you know, when we, when we build our neighbourhood plans and we, um, you know, build in different housing typologies, it's, you know, really important that, uh, that we follow through on that to provide the housing diversity to meet our Dead Sea targets. Um, I've been really reassured through this conversation that that will be the case um, and that we'll have some, some great row housing products. So thank you so much again for being here today. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. I'll move second reading of item 3.3. Second. Okay, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move consideration of third reading of item 3.3. Second. Okay. Uh, please vote for the consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. It is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20783. Second. Okay. Uh, please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that deals with the 3.3. Next, we have 3.6, 3.7, bylaw 20791 to close a portion of road right away, Anthony Hende South. Uh, cross referenced with the Bylaw 20792 to allow for development that includes a stormwater management facility, Anthony Hende South, selected by Councillor Rice. Let me see. Uh, there's no one in opposition to this. 
Councillor Rice, do you need a presentation from administration? Uh, I do not need a presentation. I just have quick questions to the applicant. To the applicant? Okay. Yes. All right. So... We have a presentation that may answer some of the questions you in advance. You want to make a presentation, Holly? Absolutely. Go ahead, then. We'll, uh, it's a quick we'll, one. Yes. No, no, no. Go ahead. You have five Thanks. minutes to do that. Right, so. Thank you. Um, good morning, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Holly Mickelson. I work for Stantec Consulting, and I'm here today on behalf of the City of Edmonton. Before you for consideration is a road closure and rezoning in the Heritage Valley area to facilitate the development and transfer of a stormwater management facility to EPCOR. This stormwater management facility is made necessary by the future development of the Lou Lawrence Operations and Maintenance Facility and future LRT extension to South Edmonton. Next slide, please. So the subject site is located south of the Anthony Henday, east of Heritage Valley Trail and north of the existing Heritage Valley Park and Ride. The stormwater management facility will include enhancements to active modes in the area, including a shared youth pathway within the stormwater management facility and shared pathways and walkway connections to pathways along Heritage Valley Trail and 127th Street. The existing trees between the subject site and the McEwen neighborhood are intended to be retained and only trees within the storm pond and access road will need removal. Next slide, please. As it was part of the TUC, the subject lands were transferred to the city by Alberta infrastructure as road right away in 2022. Um, as such, the road closure is necessary in order to develop the storm pond and eventually transfer it to EPCOR as per standard practice. There's an existing interim storm pond previously built with the park and ride facility and full build out of this storm pond, which includes the transfer to EPCOR for operations and maintenance is required with the capital line south expansion project. Next slide, please. Before you today is the road closure to close a portion of road right away. Again, that's just part of the TUC. Um, and allowing the conversion of the land to a stormwater management facility. The road closure facilitates the rezoning of the land from agricultural zone to public utility zone. And if the road closure and rezoning are approved, a subdivision would be the next step in the development process. And the land necessary for the stormwater management facility would be formally subdivided and transferred to EPCOR. Next slide, please. The proposed road closure bylaw 20791 and charter bylaw 20792 to rezone the subject site is in the grand scheme of things um, to facilitate the future development of LRT. A critical, comp critical component of the city plan is continuing to expand Edmonton's mass transit network. This means shifting our mobility system from one that is predominantly focused on individual travel by car to one that prioritizes a variety of more sustainable travel options, including light rail transit. An expanded mass transit system will connect all areas of the city and remove some barriers for those who want to and need other mobility options. We ask for your support today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Now we'll go to questions uh, to the proponent. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi, and thank you for, for the presentation, and this is really important uh, uh, development in South Area. Uh, give the factors of future RT development will be there, and also the station will be there, and this is really impact the surrounding neighborhoods. So the few questions here, the first question, and in the reports, were we are uh, repeatedly talking about this development, this two rezoning, um, the public benefits, um, specifically, and one question related, what's the impact for this rezoning uh, for the current existing park and right for that parking spot, and also the traffic on the Alice Road? So there's no, I don't anticipate that there's an impact on the park and ride facility that's existing right now. So this would just facilitate the stormwater management facility development that is needed as part of the LRT extension and the OMF facility. Um, and it's just to deal with the stormwater runoff and the stormwater management. Um, we don't expect that there would be any access changes. So 127th Street now does not connect to the Anthony Henday. There would be uh, an extension of 127th Street to the future OMF facility that is constructed. But as part of this project, um, 
the 127th Street that looks like it connects to the Anthony Hende does not connect now, and that road would be removed and rehabilitated eventually. So can you uh, can you provide a little bit of detailed information in terms of the public benefits and the mentioned in the reports in the application? Well, to speak more broadly, the public benefit would the be public would benefit from the extension of LRT. Um, and the extension of LRT necessitates this rezoning and road closure, um, providing necessary infrastructure. So public benefit, again, is just providing other modes of transportation, expanding Edmonton's transit system, um, and allowing people the option to use transit close to their neighborhood. Uh, how about the access to, to this green, uh, green spaces? And because that is uh, one big concern right now and from surrounding area, and then uh, in terms of the area, uh, there is uh, urban for forest there. There are many trees there. There are many trails there. Is there anything, an improvement based on this rezoning and it will be uh, provided that access to the residents surrounding area to the uh, to the urban uh, forest and also access to the green spaces. So as I mentioned, the existing trees uh, would be maintained as much as possible, except for the ones that are in the storm pond area. And then as part of this application, um, the stormwater management facility includes shared use paths and those pathways will connect to the paths on Heritage Valley Trail and 127th Street. So it's really creating a connected um, area with active transportation options. And then I just wanted to add about the public benefit. So adding the storm pond mi mitigates any potential flooding, not that we expected, but it mitigates stormwater management and flooding in the area as well. So that's another added public benefit. Okay, so what I heard here is the access uh, to the green spaces and that enhance the connection with different trails and will actually benefit for the people who live around that area. Yes. Okay, uh, so one more question and uh, my, uh, so people residents live there asking how many trees are in the plan to be removed because they really worry about the, some trees already moved removed earlier and then with this approved so additional trees will be removed the only trees that would be removed are anything within the storm water management facility and then just the access road to the omf so it's um it's a very small amount of trees in comparison to the larger tree stand and the tree stand in between the facility and the road and the McEwen neighborhood are intended to remain so that consideration and to preserve uh, the urban forest and an easy goal and for these trees to remove. So we will take that very, very carefully for the consideration how we move trees. So I yes. just want to confirm that. Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. That's all my question and then happy to move to close the public hearing. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Reis. Any questions to administration? I see none. Any questions from council members on any information, new information arising out of previous conversation? Seeing none, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please, to close the public hearing. Yes, I move the close public hearing and for uh, item 3.6, 3.7. Okay. Second. Councillor Principe, seconded. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the first reading and of 3.6, 3.7. Second. Thank you. Uh, we have first reading on the floor. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councilor Rice to close. Uh, nothing to add. Thank, Thank you. you. Please, okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move to the second reading of bylaw 3.6, 3.7. Second. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. I move the bylaws three just six. Hold on, just hold on. 
uh, Councillor Rice, I'll come back to you. Just display the votes, please. It was carried, right? Okay, thank you. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Sorry. <laughs> I move the uh, consideration of Sir Radian for bylaws 3.6, 3.7. Okay. Second. Okay, please vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the final reading of third reading and for for bylaw two zero seven nine one and chart bylaw two zero seven nine two. Second. Thank you. Please vote for the final readings. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we are on to uh, item 3.12, Charter Bylaw 20793 to allow for comprehensive redevelopment of a large site into a primarily residential development supporting a variety of build forms, Woodcraft, Woodcraft, exempted by Councillor Rutherford, and 3.12. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Uh, let me actually go through the list. I think now everyone was here when I checked last. Uh, Councillor. Huh? On the opposed. On the opposed. Yeah, we'll check with the, if I know Summer Dillon is here. Uh, is Denise. Ennis, joining us? Okay, not yet. Uh, uh, we'll go to administration for a presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, presenting this morning is Stuart Carlisle. He was the uh, file planner on this application. Good morning. <clears throat> this application proposes to rezone a large site in the Woodcroft neighborhood from the small, medium scale transition residential zone with a height modifier of 12 meters and the medium scale residential zone with a height modifier of 16 meters to a direct control zone to allow for the comprehensive redevelopment of a large site. Next slide, please. Located within the interior of the neighborhood, the site is currently supporting a variety of small scale residential buildings which are reaching the end of their life cycle. The site benefits from being surrounded by a variety of amenities, primarily the Westmount Shopping Center, the Woodcroft Public Library, and Coronation Park directly adjacent to this site. The site also has excellent access to mass transit and active travel modes with bike lanes available around most of the perimeter of the site and the Westmount Transit Center being located approximately 300 meters south of this site along 135th Street. Next slide, please. The general purpose of the DC zone is to allow for increased height and density compared to the current standard zones, while also providing assurances on build form transition and connectivity through a large site. Key characteristics include multiple residential buildings with heights ranging from approximately three to 10 stories, up to 750 residential dwellings, a revised network of internal roads and amenity areas, and limited commercial opportunities. Next slide, please. Administration carried out a wide variety of engagement activities for this application, including both online engagement and an in-person open house. Feedback received was generally evenly split between support and non-support. Feedback in support of this application was related to the site being an excellent location for additional density relative to its proximity to amenities and transit, as well as support for increasing Edmonton's supply of affordable housing. Feedback with concerns included hesitation about the increase in height, potential traffic congestion, and crime and social disorder. Next slide, please. The DC zone permits a variety of building heights with the majority expected to be between three and eight stories with limited opportunities for up to approximately 10 stories in the southeast corner. To provide a sensitive transition to the lower scale part of the neighborhood north of this site, height is limited to approximately three stories along 115th Avenue. Next slide, please. 
to ensure context appropriate interfaces between new development and the public realm, the DC zone identifies several different frontage areas around and within the site. For example, active residential frontage identified along 115th Avenue, shown on screen in red, requires ground level units to have individual entrances, whereas the mixed use frontage identified in the southeast area of the site, shown on screen in purple, requires ground level commercial uses to have mostly unobstructed transparent glazing. Next slide, please. To ensure this site integrates with the surrounding mobility system, a network of private streets are proposed that will accommodate a variety of transportation options, including bicycle infrastructure. Public access easements are required for the two corridors that bisect the site, identified as the blue and green dashed lines on the screen, to enhance connectivity to neighborhood amenities such as Coronation Park and the Westmount Shopping Center. Improvements to the 114th Avenue, 135th Street intersection and a new pedestrian crossing across 114th Avenue at the midpoint of the site are also required. Two common amenity areas identified on screen by the Green Stars are also provided along the north and southern edges of the site to help create a more attractive development and provide additional leisure and recreation space for residents. Next slide, please. The city plan identifies this site as being within the Westmount District Node. District nodes are identified, or pardon me, district nodes are intended to support a diverse mix of housing, employment, and amenities with built form, with the built form of mid-rise and some high-rise physically transitioning well with their surrounding areas. As the DC allows for built forms that are mostly considered to be within the mid-rise height range, with site-specific considerations provided to transitions, it is considered to be in alignment with this direction. The city plan also strives to provide residents with the ability to complete their daily needs by foot, bike, or transit uh, within, 15, within a 15 minute travel time. As this site is situated amongst a variety of amenities, including open space, shopping, and transit, it is well positioned to contribute to this target. Next slide, please. This application was presented to the Edmonton Design Committee on January 16th of this year. The committee provided a letter of support with two recommendations that the applicant attempted to address and some adjustments were made to the proposed DC zone. Next slide, please. To comply with city policy C-599, this application is required to provide a total of just under $621,000 of public amenity contributions. The applicant is chosen to satisfy this requirement through the provision of 23 bedroom dwellings designed to be attractive to families. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application because it supports the intensification of the Westmount District Node as directed by the city plan, provides additional density at a location with excellent access to a variety of amenities and transit, and allows for a variety of building types that transition well to their surroundings. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to the uh, folks in favor. Uh, Brian Murray, uh, are you going to make a presentation? Yes, the clerk has my presentation there. Okay, because the rest of your folks are, the oh, rest of the people signed to speak in favor are to answer questions only. So please go ahead, Brian. Perfect, thank you. Well, good morning, Mayor Sohi and members of City Council. I'm thrilled to present to you the future vision for the Brentwood Home site, dedicated to providing needed affordable housing during this time of crisis. Next slide, please. The Brentwood Community Development Group has been an active and engaged affordable housing provider in the Woodcroft community since the 1950s. At the start of this project, Brentwood and our multidisciplinary project team worked to establish a clear vision and set of goals to guide our master plan, uh, building upon the tight-knit community that already lives there today. Brentwood has made a clear commitment to create a safe and welcoming place with new housing, local shops and services, pedestrian and cycling connections, all while continuing to be a good neighbor in the community. Brentwood has also made a clear commitment that not a single resident would lose their housing due to the redevelopment of this property. A resident transition coordinator has been in place helping to relocate residents from the first phase of development to vacant units in later stages, ensuring everyone continues to have a home at Brentwood while it is being redeveloped. Next slide, please. 
Because of Brentwood's longstanding history in the neighborhood, we made a commitment to connect with our residents early and often while working with the broader community for ongoing feedback into the process to help improve our plans. We held dedicated sessions for our residents, open houses for the public, and overall had good conversations with engaged neighbors. Next slide, please. As you know, we can never fully satisfy all members of the community, but we have attempted to create a master plan that thoughtfully considers our residents' needs and opportunities presented by our neighbors. We have, in, we have ensured a sensitive urban interface along the north edge of our site by limiting height and maintaining the townhome character while in a new form of development. We have pushed parking underground and have right-sized our parking ratio to align with historical user data provided ample bicycle parking and created direct connections to transit and bus stops. With parking underground, we have created unique open space and amenity opportunities for not only our residents, but for the broader community to be invited into the site to ensure Brentwood remains a vibrant community hub for all. Next slide, please. This illustrative master plan highlights the project team's commitment to working with our community to achieve a vibrant, livable, and family-oriented development in proximity to services and transit. Overall, the site is adding 502 net new homes for a total of 735 units and the possibility to increase to 750 as captured in our zoning. You can see the significant increase in two, three, and four bedroom units, ensuring this development meets the needs of families in need. The development is highly permeable for, for pedestrians and cyclists to access the significant amenities in the neighborhood and enjoy two significant open space areas that are envisioned to be highly animated throughout the year. Next slide, please. Our team has created a sensitive development that responds to its development context with increases in density forming the southern edge adjacent to Coronation Park and other high density developments. Through the direct control uh, approach and aligning to the aims of the new zoning bylaw, our team has created a framework to allow the project to evolve over time while ensuring key commitments and constraints are maintained to give certainty to both Brentwood and the community as this project develops over the next 15 years. Next slide, please. Working with our team and integrating input from the community, we have created a range of amenities planned within the large open spaces, along with more private amenities for the residents of Brentwood that are all season, engage the senses, and create gathering places that strengthen community connections. Next slide, please. Here you have a sense of the open spaces and how they interface with the urban form to create a sense of place and enclosure while um, have publicly accessible private spaces throughout. Next slide, please. Again, additional views of our planned open spaces, play areas, and community focal points. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. We're happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now questions to the proponent. Okay. Here we go. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm gonna actually, <laughs> Uh, direct my first line of questioning to uh, Mr. Appleyard. Still on the line? I'm here. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm doing well yourself. Good. Um, just to, can you, so this is meant to be a mixed use project, correct? Mixed income, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not mixed, sure what you like, mean mixed, mixed, like, so from market to, to affordable. Yeah, it'd be near market all the way down to deep subsidy. Near market to deep subsidy. Okay. And how many um, units are currently on the site? Can you remind me? Um, 236. 236. And of those, how many are three bedroom? Oh, um... <laughs> I'm going to touch the map here. Uh, what would it be? Counselor, uh, 104. 104? Our three bedroom? You bet. Okay. And in the 338 units, how many? I know it said that there was 20 guaranteed three bedroom dwellings, 23 bedroom dwellings. Um, is that all that we're planning to build in that new DC1? No, certainly that's just to satisfy the community amenity policy. Uh, okay. We have 308 three bedroom and 34 bedroom. 
372 bedroom and 27 one bedroom. Okay. Okay. So it's 308 three bedroom units. So as you mentioned with the transition coordinator, anybody in a, in a, one of those one, 104 units, three bedroom right now would have a comparable transition space. That's our intention is yep. that three bedrooms will be able to move to three beds and two beds will be able to move to two beds. Okay. Okay. No, that's helpful. And another thing I've heard a lot from community uh, with regards to this project is concern over um, just general uh, crime. And I talked a lot about crime prevention through environmental design. So maybe to Mr. Murray, how was that feedback heard during your engagements with the community and what considerations were put into this project? around uh, sort of that crime prevention through environmental design as you've been building out this this project? Yeah, certainly, Council, we're at early stages and, and in the zoning um, uh, framework, uh, we have considered environmental design, uh, whether it's through the our open spaces, um, some, of, some of the opportunities for parkade entrances, as well as ensuring that our buildings are uh, not quite so expansive. Um, we've created opportunities for permeability and ultimately a lot of ground oriented units, which allows for those you know eyes on the street. Um, certainly when we get to the development permit stage, we have to go back through the Edmonton Design Committee and also um, be working with the city's development office team to ensure that we have applied uh, those crime prevention um, at the design stage. As, as well, uh, I'll add that the uh, site currently is part of the City of Edmonton's Crime Free Program, and we're hoping to maintain that status yeah. within the new um, years. Because when I look, for example, like, because this is a direct control, so maybe I'll ask that question to administration. Okay, just a second. I'm just making a note. Okay, and uh, are there any contributions that the developer is making to traffic calming? I'm specifically thinking, I know that there is identified um, traffic calming measures that are gonna be installed on 114th Ave, but is there any kind of contribution or contemplation around some of the already existing traffic concerns in the area? Yeah, maybe I'll I'll pass it over to Ms. Oberg from Bunt. Great. Good morning. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. The uh, a neighborhood uh, renewal program was completed previously, and so there were curb bulbs incorporated at some of the surrounding intersections. The focus of the improvements that are being um, included by Brentwood are around pedestrian safety, particularly at the new cross mid block crosswalk on 114th Avenue, which will include the crossing as well as some traffic calming measures, as well as the potential future signalization of 114th Avenue and 135th Street. Okay, so are those city funded or developer funded? The, the crosswalk, mid block crosswalk is developer funded okay. and there's a set amount um, identified, $100,000 to contribute to the signal at 114th Avenue and 135th Street. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you. I might come back for another round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Another for Councillor Stevenson. Yes, good morning. Uh, great, great to see you, Rob. Great to see you, Brian. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, I... My questions are gonna seem very counterintuitive uh, or maybe a different track than I normally take. Um, I think the plan you've proposed is is outstanding. I think it's beautiful. I think it will contribute greatly to the community and, and particularly meeting our affordable housing needs. And my only question is, you know, is it too nice? Like I, I see the, the significant contribution of open space that you've provided. Um, just wondering what, what kind of led to that, if that's part of the vision for the community you wanted to build, or, or if there were some restrictions that that you felt meant that you you couldn't sort of develop the site as fully as you would like. Great question. Uh, definitely a different train of thought than that you would want down. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time with the community, and of course, Rob and the Brentwood team has been a neighbor for well since the the um, the neighborhood began. 
And so as part of the design of our open space, and Shannon McKinnon is here from Tool Design Group, we really focused on, um, you know, what would make a meaningful difference in the lives of the residents. Um, so you see some programming that's uh, sprinkled throughout the site in the illustrated concept plan that is really about the community, whether it's having community celebrations or being able to, you know, do a little bit of gardening, you know, kind of connect with the earth. Um, and then we have two of the, the, the kind of more public programmable spaces. And our hope is to, of course, have food trucks and invite people um, and to have the community celebrations that actually occur there today, just in a different form. So, um, no, our intent is to bring the vision to life. That's the commitment we've made to the community. Um, you'll notice in the zoning, it is quite permissive and flexible, and that's because of the evolving nature of affordable housing um, today and moving forward is just being able to manage um, some of that as the, the plan develops over 15 years. Okay. But by and large, uh, the bill of goods that we've sold is our commitment to the community. Well, and, and you know, I, I deeply respect that, and I think it really speaks to to the excellent work that, that you do in the community. And I I just want to make sure that's not coming at the cost of a, of a viable development project uh, uh, for yourselves. Um, but I yeah, part of the Rob, yeah. drive for the open space too is we're we're targeting to serve families, four bedroom units, mm -hmm. three bedroom units. We're hoping to have a tremendous amount of kids on site. I drive by every morning on my way to work, and <clears throat> I pass school bus after school bus after school bus. But those kids need somewhere to go and play, especially the younger ones. The older ones cross the street and use the facilities at the community hall. But we have three playgrounds on site, and a lot of that green space is about giving families the room that they need outdoors. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you. I, it's wonderful to see. And um, I think we'll, we'll make for, for a wonderful community, both on the site and, and then for the surrounding neighbors as well. Um, maybe just one other um, question, just to, to delve into a bit of the details. And again, some of the, the buildability. So I love the multimodal corridor. I think providing that east-west sort of um, diagonal alignment is, is great in terms of desire lines for people passing through the site. Just with 137th Street, um, just wondering why that alignment sort of angled east-west instead of providing sort of more of that, that grid pattern. Was that just around building sort of development parcels? Uh, again, just want to confirm that that works for you, that that provides you with, with viable development parcels. Councillor, just to confirm, are you speaking about the bikeway that extends east-west or the north-south connection between 114 and 115? The north-south connection. Yeah, so it's it's actually not a through connection, um, and so it is not uh, necessarily uh, open to the public for the community to travel through to 114. It's really intended to be more of a local circulator to get to um, some of the units that are um, on the on north side of the site, um, as well as the other circulator. Uh, circul roads are really about getting folks underground um, and so that's kind of the primary motivation it was never intended to be a through street because we do want to ensure that it is safe for kids and we are providing the opportunities for people to walk and cycle as a priority on site um, which is one of the desired modes with this community gotcha okay so people uh you know walking or cycling through that's sort of a, a reasonable desire line in terms of potentially you know wanting to access the gotcha. Um, ballparks, the other amenities sort of down to the south there? Okay. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. That's a really helpful explanation. Uh, no no further questions to you. Thank you again uh, for bringing this forward. Thank you, Constance Stevenson. Constance Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is a really exciting application. Uh, I have a few questions just to build on that. Um, so the north-south pathway did I hear correctly that that is not intended to be a, a through street, but there will there still is, be connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists, correct? That's right. Yeah, the, okay. the intent here is that it's just people living there that circulate through. It's not a through street. Okay, gotcha. Um, thanks for that. Now, when it comes to um, the parking ratio here, so I guess 851 parking stalls. Was it always your intention to have such a such a high parking ratio, or was this in response to community feedback and some of the um, the concerns that you heard from neighbors? Um, no, it's primarily based on what we perceive as being required from both um, those tenants who would desire parking and for visitors. Um, we've also included, which are not in the calculation, a small amount of short-term on-street or on private road parking uh, just for folks if they're dropping off their groceries, getting into the townhomes. Um, so no, it wasn't driven necessarily by the community. It was really driven by our opportunity to provide underground um, in a cost-effective manner. 
um, and provide the necessary um, visitor parking stalls. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and then just just wanted to get a little bit of elaboration on um, just the intended phasing of the development. I know you'd mentioned uh, that not a single resident would lose their housing due to the redevelopment of this property. Yeah. Um, yeah can you maybe just just walk me through that? Sure. Yeah, generally the phasing is intended to start on the southwest corner of the site. That's a servicing uh, requirement because we do have to keep servicing connected as we're kind of evolving through the site. So the general intent is to move from west to east um, and uh, by and large it would be kind of the southwest moving along to the north and then ending on the southeast corner. So um, ultimately as a new development is built, those that were potentially moved out or others who want to move in would then be relocated to the new buildings and we would continue down that path. Um, that phasing has also been shared with the residents of the community and we're actively engaged with them um, throughout the, the duration of the project. Okay, really, really good to hear that commitment. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, also, you know, whenever, whenever I see a large site like this and um, an application of this scale, I always think about just the permeability of the site. And I know it was brought up earlier um, in the context of um, you know, crime prevention through environmental design, but I also think it comes into play when we're talking about just the integration with surrounding community and integration with the surrounding parcels. Um, are there specific features, I guess, that you would point to that um, that highlight that permeability? I'm thinking of even things like building length. Um, the multimodal corridor is kind of an obvious one, but is there anything else that enhances that permeability? Um, not so much that we've captured in zoning, um, but in our uh, illustrated master plan, and as we've um, been working through the site, a lot of pedestrian pathways have been included um, and oriented, uh, particularly around a lot of our town units and anything. Uh, first of all, the whole site is intended to be street oriented. Um, so a lot of our play, play spaces would have um, kind of that passive surveillance opportunity, um, as well, of course, little kids out there, they're going to be with their, their moms um, and, and parents. So lots of opportunity for site search circulation, lots of passive and active surveillance. Um, and as well, of course, this site is operated and maintained by Brentwood full time. So there is always site operators um, on and around um, the site. The Brentwood offices are also moving directly onto the site. They're currently across the street in the Matheson. Um, so there'll be ongoing um, operations um, on site. Okay, fantastic. Um, and maybe, well, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. Okay. Um, and just one question. So I know, uh, I'm just thinking of the library uh, being sort of a, a real anchor and kind of destination for mm -hmm. surrounding community members. Um, what would, so the corner, I guess, of 135 Street and 114th Avenue, um, thoughts on how to potentially, you know, just ensure that that's a really, really prominent corner um, and a safe corner for folks who might be going back and forth. Maybe I'll ask Ms. Oberg to chime in on the pedestrian opportunities. Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Salvador. The Through the review, the intersection of 114th Ave, 135th Street is currently a four-way stop. Um, the next level of crossing protection for pedestrians goes up to traffic signal. Um, we had identified it within the TIA that it's a candidate for signalization as the neighbourhood develops. And that's one of the areas where um, the zoning includes some funding commitment from Brentwood contributing to that signalized intersection. So that's the next level that it would go to um, once it meets warrants. And that's where our funding commitment has been placed. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to the applicant for bringing forward this important uh, application for council consideration. Uh, on the uh, your commitment to helping your current clients, tenants, uh, in the Q&A that's captured by the administration, your answer is also captured to that, right? So, which is which is good. I think I'm I'm satisfied with an answer. But I need more clarity on the on the three and more bedroom counts that you shared with us. Uh, when I go through Q and A, it only talks about what is required under the uh, under policy C five nine nine. But you shared numbers that are much greater than that, right? But they are not captured in the uh, in the Q and A, right? So I just want to know from accountability point of view that what you are promising to deliver 
will be delivered. I don't doubt that you will deliver, but uh, you know things change. We won't be here. Uh, this development will take 10 to 15 years. Things change, hand change, and uh, you know, development changes. Just want to get a sense from you, like how do you, how do you ensure this accountability built into that? What you're committing to do, will you, you'll deliver that? Yeah, yeah, and no, I appreciate that, Mayor. Um, I think you're referring to administration's response, which is a direct uh, correlation to what's in the zoning. Uh, so appreciate they can only say what they know for certainty. Um, our commitment through our basically the development program that we've been working on for the past 18 months is to develop um, 738 units, primarily in the two, three bedroom range. So uh, we have uh, our uh, of course, uh, Rob is here to speak to the actual development. Our architects are actively working on the first phase application. Um, and we are providing 27 one bedroom, 372 bedroom, 308 three bedroom and 34 bedroom. That's on the public record. Okay. And um, if we can provide more, we will. And if there's an opportunity to intensify the site as we're into development and grant funding is stable and, and there's more that can be done, We'll come back, Mayor, and ask for, for more density at that time. Got it. And my next question is to, like, how many affordable, like, you have near market, then you have all the way to deep subsidy, right? Uh, am I understanding correctly that the, the total amount of affordable housing units will increase by four times? I'm going to ask Rob to chime in on the breakdown of affordability. Yeah, that's a, it's a complex question because of the grant we're applying to will define um, how our subsidy programs operate going forward. But the current target is that 30% um, of the units will receive a 40% discount at a minimum, 30% of the units receive a 30% discount at a minimum, sorry, 10% of 40, 10% of the units receive a 40% discount 30% receive a 30% discount. Another 30% receives a 10% discount. So it works, the way the grants work is it sits inside tiers. Um, and then so we can take the number of units, you times it by 10.1 and that gives you the number that we get that 40% as we build across the site. Does that answer your question? It does. I think it will be helpful. I know you, you have shared a lot of numbers right, on number of yeah. units, affordable, rental, and I'm sorry, uh, one bed, two bedroom, three bedroom. It will be helpful like, if you could uh, maybe send us an email about uh, all the stuff that you're sharing here today. That uh, then we, uh, uh, I think this is a good story that needs, to, if, if, if council approves it, I think uh, adding more affordable housing units in the city is a goal that this, this, city, this council has aspired to do, right? So I think it'll be a good story for us to uh, kind of share with constituents as well, right? So I think if you could share those numbers with us, we'll appreciate it. Happy to, yeah, but you thank, bet. Thank you so much. Uh, I will take the, uh, I'll move, the, sorry, I'll take the chair back. I'll return the chair. And I'll go to Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have a question, I believe, uh, Mr. Appleyard, maybe you can answer this question. Um, what is the age of the current structures there? I heard so it was the, at the end of the life. Yeah, the current structures were built in 1952. And back in 52, the cement plant was pretty far away. So they did what's called coal pouring. So the foundations have um, bad cracking. So when we hit the spring here, we get really bad flooding in the units. Um, so they're from a design perspective, from a maintenance perspective, and from a foundational perspective, they don't have a long life left in them. Um, we could squeeze a few more years out, but you get into that. How much money do you want to spend to keep something up and going? The maintenance costs on the, uh, the existing townhouses are very, very high compared to what you put into uh, normal units. Okay. Yeah. And I agree. Like, where do you... Is it best to put the money in? So my question, the reason I ask that is because when I look at the photos, it actually looks really good. The buildings actually look really good. They look newer. It looks like it has new roofing, new windows, new siding. It, that's what it appears like in the photos. Yeah, Has there and been that's, work done recently? That's misleading. So 
going back about 15 years ago, we wrapped the buildings in vinyl, um, replaced the windows, replaced the doors, and we've always kept the roofs up. Um, your lifespan on a roof is typically 25 to 30 years. So, um, you know, we're looking at a 15 year build out. So we have kept all of that up to date instead of letting it diminish. We think that by keeping it up to date, actually, it, it provides a higher quality of life for the tenants we serve, right? Um, but it, the underlying structures uh, have hit that point where um, the, the electrical systems have been upgraded. The boiler systems are all in need of another replacement. Um, there's a lot of pieces there to the mechanical, electrical, plumbing side that we're limping along is the way to say it. Okay, great. Thank you. Those were my only questions. Thank you. Uh, can you move the second round? Yeah, I'm happy to move the second round. Second. Second. Thank you. Councilor Prince, Councilor uh, Nack. Thank you. Please vote. I'm yes. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councilor Rice. Vote, Councilor Rice. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, my colleagues asked a lot of the questions, so I just have two outstanding questions for the proponent right now. Um, I am going to go to Mr. Murray first, and then you can delegate if you think it belongs to somebody else on the delegation. Um, or that sign up to speak. The design committee had recommended front facing units along 114th, but I see in the, in the direct control on item 10.2 that there, it only mentions ground orientated units fronting 115. Uh, any comments on that? It seems yeah. counter to the design committee's uh, recommendation and advice. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Councillor. Um, and I, I do appreciate they've given us the support um, with some you know, opportunities to improve. Um, so the zoning is, is written in a way that is guaranteeing street-oriented units along 115. But our intent is to have the entire site, even for the units um, internal to the to the um, bikeway and some of the internal driveways, um, that they would also be kind of street um, oriented. So we're just trying to provide flexibility in the site. Um, it is a 15 year long affordable housing grant funded project. And we're just trying to provide as much flexibility as possible to dynamically change as we need to in order to bring the, the overall vision to life. So um, we've made commitments to the public about uh, being street oriented and wanting to maintain that kind of town home or at least great uh, street oriented character. Um, and our intent is to do just that. Um, for whatever reason, um, should we need to change from a design perspective due to costing, um, value engineering, whatever it might be, we're just trying to provide that flexibility in the zoning. So it's all possible, just not required. Um, 115 is our most sensitive interface to the existing residents. Um, we have quite a bit more flexibility along 139 and 114, not to say it's not important, it is to us. Um, however, we're just making a different commitment to our neighbors on the north. Yeah, because the in the in the planning of that site, I noticed that a lot of the higher density is on the south side because that would be facing the park. So from a sun shadowing effect, is that what you're referring to? The sun shadows certainly uh, basically fall primarily onto our own site, um, and it also mirrors some of the context. So we try and match some of the similar context to the east, like the Matheson, some of the higher rise developments to the south. There is no development, so we have quite a bit more. Um, flexibility when it comes to that interface. Okay. Um, I'll follow up with a question to admin on the, the design committee recommendation. Um, I just want to confirm one final thing around, and I guess um, to Mr. Johnson, if I'm out of order, please let me know. But I do think that the, the transition planning is important. You know, this is the second one in the ward recently that's come up where people are living in existing units that will be demolished for building new units, which is great, and, and in this case, a higher proportion of them. Um, but 
what happens in the interim between, like what phase are you building out first of this project? And yep. where will those, because you said you have a transition coordinator, but where are those renters, those people that are relying on that affordable housing in the stopgap between demolition and construction? Can you walk me through that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the development will start on the southwest corner of the site, generally the west side, if you just want to keep it to one direction. And through attrition on the property, Brentwood has actually been holding vacant units on the site. So other townhouses, perhaps just more towards the east. And so the resident transition coordinator in Brentwood have been essentially moving people out of the first phase um, into um, more eastern parts of the site. So um, those, uh, some of those folks have already been relocated. Others are identified and we're working through um, to have them relocated. By and large, by the time um, should council approve this and we're into demolition, uh, the first phase will be completely vacated and those residents will be on a different part of our site. As the development um, is built, the new development is built, of course, there's a bit more density in that first phase. Um, we're able to move not only people back should they um, choose to move back into that west side of the property, but then the next phase would also be accommodated in the newer development or elsewhere on the site, however that may shake out depending on their desired um, move. So there are some options back to the resident and Brentwood's made that commitment. So just quickly in my eight seconds, does phase one have a lot of three bedroom de development then? Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know for sure, Councillor. We're just going through the development. 10 units. 10 so units. There's 10, there's 10 three beds, 10 two beds that have to be moved. And at this point, 40% of those tenants have already been relocated. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So that concludes. So that concludes the questions to uh, uh, the proponent. Now we will go to uh, uh, members of the public who have registered to speak in opposition. Summer Dillon, if you please, could please come down. Uh, and then uh, Denise Enns. Hello, I'm Denise Enns, but I couldn't get my remote working. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. So we will come to you second after we have heard from Summer Dillon. Okay, thank you. You have a choice. You want to sit down, or you want to? No, uh, uh, no. Do, you know, let me assure you, <laughs> this is pretty comfortable atmosphere. Okay. You know, don't be nervous at all. You know what? Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, many many people come make presentations to council, yeah. and have have we have seen today, right? So, uh, make yourself comfortable. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, it's just that I'm going against the tide. So if you can just let me speak as a tenant. Uh, please um, absolutely speak, I know it's speak freely. Not make a difference, but I just want to share my notes here. So I'm a current tenant and have lived on the proposed site for the last three and a half years. So I'm very familiar with the site. I am a supporter of densification. However, I don't see this proposal as one that would make for a healthy community. Rather, I see it as a problematic plan with way too many people for the land size. There will not be enough space for people to live and thrive. Children constitute a large percentage of the population and I worry about their safety as they ride their bikes and play outside. I don't believe this to be a safe plan for them. It is currently unsafe for the kids as they play in the same thoroughfares where traffic flows in and out. There are too many buildings and not enough green space, playgrounds and outdoor congregating spaces to gather. Waste management is problematic already. Oftentimes the bins overflow and garbage is thrown around the bins. Increasing the population would make this much worse. There are already two high rise buildings and one low rise building on the east side of 135th Street. The townhouses are falling apart and Brentwood does not fix them even when they pose a potential threat to resident safety. There are concerns that they will not be able to maintain the three to four fold increase in dwellings. And based on past and current experiences, there are concerns about Brentwood as a builder and as a landlord, such as countless Residential Tenancies Act breaches and building code offenses, some of which had been communicated to Councillor Rutherford's office in the past. Tenants are afraid to speak up because they are fearful of retaliation towards them. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Please stay. Uh, there might be some questions to you from council members, but we next going to go to uh, Denise Inns uh, and hear from her. Then we'll come back to both of you for questions. Uh, Denise, Denise, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have two uh, no misconceptions about the outcome of this meeting but I will take this opportunity to voice my opinions and observations while I'm still allowed. Um, if the altruistic claims of Brentwood Homes and BA Studios about being good neighbors are to, believe, to be believed, there are a few things I would like to see enacted. One, given the quadrupling of the population of this site and the expected increase of crime, 24 seven on-site security be in place. Two, extra parking and driveway allowances have not been made for the proposed child care center and food and drink establishment, whatever that may be, and other unnamed commercial ventures uh, be made. Three, 851 cost-effective parking, parking stalls, I assume not free, are not located immediately adjacent to the housing, especially the townhouses. Therefore, single parents struggling to get their children and groceries into their homes are, are going to park on the public streets rather than more distant parkades. Street parking will not only cause congestion, but hinder already scant snow removal and street cleaning. Four, stacked townhouses of three stories are not conducive to young families, flights of stairs separating young children from guardians, not to mention increased health risks, climbing stairs to 10 children and carrying laundry. Stairs are among the top five high incident domestic accident and fatality rates. I expect groups that co of co-renters will be more likely to occupy these spaces, creating further instability of housing community and less strict vetting of occupants beyond credit rating be done. Shadow analysis also puts the first three deep properties on the north side of 115th Street in permanent shadow from late fall to early spring when sunlight is needed most especially for people with sun effective issues. There is not better. You may house more people, but those people are more susceptible to harm and displacement from th things such as fire, especially in buildings over eight stories, severe storms, power outages of which the city is uh, experiencing more and more. Condensed populations are also more likely to suffer from anxiety and other mental health issues, as well as physical health, such as increased rates of cancer and asthma. I believe the increased pressure placed by the city to uh, build more housing has more to do with the 82 billion taxpayer dollars created by the CMHC national housing strategy going to a relatively small, not necessarily Canadian percentage of the population. When I asked the representative of BNA Studios at one of the drop-in meetings if BNA were making a cash grab for the funds, he answered, of course, like most developers across Canada. The focus of city council to promote nodes and corridors of the district designs are, is arguably fall, flawed. Dispersion of population is best in many re respects, but to pur purposefully strive to increase density along public transportation model that is yet to be proven to work. The present transit buses and trains are questionably rely unreliable and the transportation system and routing needs, needs improvement. People are not going to want to ride trains and buses, let alone live near stations when people are literally being killed and assaulted. Before you start rebuilding Edmonton around a transportation model, make sure the transportation system works. Give Edmontonians a direct way to respond to the city council's underlying, uh, underlying plan. Hold a referendum for a district plan, 15 minute districts and other plans such as rezoning priority uh, areas. These vast changes permanently change the geography and topography of Edmonton should be voted upon by all of Edmonton as should have been the city plan in the new city, city uh, zoning bylaw. Specifically, Redwood Homes is turning from a family-oriented townhouse community that, has, uh, that it used to boast to a diverse population structure that is far less secure and stable. Families will be less likely to wish to live here and in Brett, uh, Woodcroft in general. Instead of creating a safe community, you will be sabotaging a neighborhood. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now we'll have questions to... Uh... 
uh, folks registered to speak in opposition. I'll see if there are questions from council members. Councilor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah, to, to Ms. Enns, uh, can you just clarify, uh, are, are you a Woodcroft resident? Yes, I am. Do you live near this development? I live or? right on right on 115. 115, okay. Because you mentioned about the shadowing. Have you right. looked at the shadow studies in the report? Yes, I have. And uh, did, what are your thoughts on the fact that it'll be the smaller units to the to the north and the, the taller units to the south on the site. Well, I know that I know that right now the second story townhouses are already like uh, uh, the shadows in the winter time cross the street um, to add that extra story for a third three house stacking um, would actually um, and according to even their shadow analysis um, especially through winter uh, solstice um, and late fall, early spring, um, that three houses deep on this side of the street will be in shadow for the winter time. So as I say, vastly uh, affecting people's mentality. I don't even know how those shadows in sight on their, on their property would affect the housing in there. Okay, and uh I am going to go to Ms. Dillon now. Um, thank you and thank you for your correspondence in, adv in advance prior to the date of this public hearing being set. Um, uh, there's a, there is a sentiment that I keep hearing come up and, and I've seen it a lot in terms of even the number of folks that are signed up to speak at public hearing about sort of a, it's already a done deal kind of sentiment. Um, I guess, you know, you're here representing the residents. What kind of conversations have you had with your um, neighbors that, you know, I know they're not here today, but that they, that, that we should be hearing in our consideration of this decision? Well, I think that um, the tenant perspective is very different from the public perspective, which is really, um, for me, is such a contrast. Um, yeah, it's very different. So, um, they're just concerned about the density, the increase in crime, you know, waste is already an issue, um, children's safety, much of what I spoke about. Um, so it's just a genuine concern that we want our, you know, our neighborhood to remain safe and, and healthy. Yeah. Can you speak to the waste? Because you said waste is already an issue. What's, yeah, what's like, the current issue? Well, well, there's, I mean, they're regularly overflowing, like the, the waste bins. So if they're going to increase by three to four, dwellings. I don't know how they're going to deal with that if it's already an issue with just, you know, the 200 and some odd dwellings. Okay, so you would want some consideration for how that waste management is being done and especially uh, with the, the multi-unit which doesn't exist right now. Okay, I'll follow up with that. And you what are your thoughts on, first of all, my line of questioning to the proponent on the crime prevention through environmental design? Um, there's a lot of research that shows that certain ways of a built structure can influence both positively or negatively uh, crime. Any thoughts on, on you know, that being integrated into the next phase? Would that help ease your concerns to, to Ms. Dillon? That's okay. Like, I really don't know. I mean, that's sort of in the professionals. You yeah, know, no, that's I'm a fair. A professional, so. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll ask the same question to Ms. Enns, Ms. Mrs. Enns. Um, well, I don't know how you design to, a, a building design will actually um, infringe upon people of criminal orient. And, and uh, as I say, it has to do with more vetting of, of occupants rather than um, building design. Like I, you could put up as many lights as you want to and there's still crime that goes on during the day. So, uh, and actually scouting happens quite often uh, in daylight hours. So I, I, as I am not a professional either in those 
in that realm, but uh, I certainly uh, question that just a building structure itself will will deter criminal behavior. That's fair. I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you to both of our speakers for joining us today. Um, really, you know, appreciate the the considerations, and certainly a lot of important points uh, raised. Um, just to ensure that we, we are um, achieving achieving those outcomes. So maybe just to, to miss uh, Speaker Dillon, I, w I was surprised to hear your, your uh, perspective that there was an adequate open space. Um, for me, this seems, you know, my impression was that it was actually quite quite generous with that. So just wanting to understand that a little bit more. Is it the, the type of open space or what what were your thoughts there? I just thought for the, you know, that extra amount of people, it just didn't strike me as enough. But, I mean, that's just my perspective, okay. living on the site. Yeah, no, that's 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 fair. Um, you know, I I reflect on the fact that there, there, there are sort of, um, you know, quite a bit of open space around the site as well. Is that... Mm -hmm. Um, is that something that tenants on the site are currently able to access or something that I think we talked a little bit about some of the crossing points, just improving those? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, as long as there's, you know, increased safety around the crosswalks and stuff, because that's definitely an issue. There's a school, well, there's schools nearby. Yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, Coronation Park, it's great to have that big park nearby, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, you know, I think your question around waste management is really important, certainly something I'll follow up on. Um, and I think I actually heard the answer to my question, just uh, uh, Speaker Enns, you, you spoke about, so the concern around crime, the concern is that new occupants won't be vetted as successfully. Was that what I was understanding from your comments? Uh, yeah, well, I, I question right now um, about the vetting of the occupants there sometimes. The, uh, when I moved into this, this neighbourhood, I, I, I presently live alone, um, that I walked the area to make sure that I would feel safe and secure. And I did it on long weekends and, and things like that. And I felt um, pretty good day and night uh, walking through here. Um, since I've moved in uh, 10 years ago, I've noticed uh, greater activity um, that is not so safe to me um, over there and to just increase that population um, over there. I mean, it's just a fundamental fact that you're going to get more people or it's going to be more crime. So, um, well, I, I, yeah, I, I question the vetting. Yeah, and I don't. I don't know that that is a fundamental fact. I don't know that we we necessarily see that that correlation. And and sometimes additional population, additional activity can can make um, areas safer. So I guess I'm I'm just um, concerned about any any assumptions around around folks who are who are maybe living in those properties being more likely to be involved in crime. I'm not sure that that's that's been borne out. No, no, and, 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 but if you, it is actually statistically a valid case that just more population, and it's not that we're asking for a criminal element there or anything like that um, by, the, by the structures themselves, but just in Woodcroft in general, um, by population, you're going to get a chance of, uh, of a certain amount of people doing things, that's all. Okay, well, I'll, I'll follow up with administration. Um, and those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Stevenson. Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to both the speakers for being with us today and, and sharing your perspectives. I know you, you brought up some things that I hadn't contemplated. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, maybe I'll go to speaker Dylan first. Uh, really appreciate you bringing the tenant perspective. And um, yeah brought up some things that we might not otherwise have heard. So uh, particularly around waste management, um, like co other colleagues, I'll follow up on that. But I wanted to dig into just the safety for kids. Um, maybe can you can you provide some insight into sort of the current context of um, of, of safety for children in the neighborhood or in, in, in that particular area? You spoke about uh, how they play in areas where there's sort of a lot of vehicle traffic and some of the thoroughfares. Um, help me understand the current context. Yeah, so it's actually very unsafe because 
the roads that the vehicles use, the kids play in there, and very young kids. You know, I'm surprised that nobody's gotten hurt. Um, so that's just a big concern. There's such a huge um, percentage of kids of all ages and growing families and um, new immigrants and stuff. So um, I just want to make sure that it's safe and that the children aren't riding their bikes and running around in those same areas that the vehicles are traveling in. Because a lot of them don't have their parents with them. They're just playing in groups, right? So right. just concerned about that. Okay. Okay. And um, just to get a little more specific, like where are we talking about like 114, 115, like 139? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, like all, all of, like coming in from um, 114th, coming in from 115th. Um, yeah, they're just all intermingling, like they're all okay. together, yeah. Okay, so, because when I look at, when I look at what's proposed, um, sort of internal to the site, it looks like there's some, yeah, like some good cross-cutting and, and pedestrian pathways, but you're actually saying sort of the perimeter and, and the ways that people get into and out of the site. That's I think where that's important because kids yeah. tend to just use, you know, they don't really have any logic. They kind of just go wherever there's an open space. So. Thank you so much for, for that point, and I can follow up um, with administration and the applicant on that. Um, also wanted to ask just... Uh, yeah, around around the engagement piece, um, and curious if if you attended some of those sessions or if you received any of the mail outs or uh, sort of information um, prior to. Yeah, I did receive the information. Um, I didn't actually. I wasn't able to go. I just had other commitments. Um, I wish I could have, but um, yeah. Okay. Okay. All good. Just wanted to make sure you know folks were yeah. receiving that information. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll go to speaker and as well to Denise. Uh, you know, you brought up an interesting point um, and wanted some clarity just around families being, I think you mentioned families will be less likely to live in the area. And I'm just trying to understand that because uh, my read of the application is that there would be uh, a lot more three bedroom plus units uh, that could accommodate larger families. Yeah, and I appreciate that fact that, that there are uh, being more bedrooms. The, the problem is is that I, I believe uh, a lot of those uh, units are going to be the townhouse units. Um, that, that, as I say, there is a, a, a stair issue. It's not uh, in, for older families it might be good. Um, but I, I know that originally at one point uh, at, at one of the engagement uh, meetings, um, I was told that they were also trying to increase increase uh, student housing and things like that there that they um, which means that they're not necessarily going to be families but uh, co renting families structures um, that will also be using the three bedroom structures but I have talked to um, two families and I'm uh, from the Brentwood that said that they're actually thinking of moving on because they do not think that uh, that their safety will, will be an issue for their children too. Okay, um, well that, that clarifies. So just having, just, having, just having three bedrooms does not uh, ensure that those are gonna be family units. Okay, well I'll, I'll follow up with some questions to administration and the applicant on that, but I uh, really appreciate you sharing your perspective. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Uh, sorry, Councillor Silver. Councillor Neck, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. Thank you both for being here. I just uh, a few more questions uh, for for Ms. Dillon. Just wanted to double check because uh, I, I heard your answer to Councillor Salvador, so I just want to make sure I'm I'm right on what I understand is uh, when you talk about sort of the kids sort of out playing. I, I thought what you were originally referring to is sort of out playing on the internal roadway network in the development. But but if I heard correctly, the bigger concern you had was the kids sort of out playing on. On the exterior roads around, is that is that? Well, on the exterior, but also the interior. Yeah. Like they're all over the place. You know, like they're going, um, just moving about in the neighborhood. Yeah. You know, going to the mall or to the park or whatever. So there's yeah. lots of movement there. So I just want to make sure that there's safety in place, like crosswalks and things like that, and Absolutely. just. Um, just, I don't know what the answer is to that, but just yeah. safety for the kids. Yeah, and I, the reason I was asking, uh, particularly on the interior side of things, and I've heard that there's some work that has to be done in the exterior no matter what. Um, when I looked at the two designs, the interior design of the new plan seemed to be a bit more 
thoughtful around that aspect because the way I understand I've got family lives close by there is that uh, all of the parking is sort of you know at street level right in front of the units and, and so you got a lot of cars backing in and out and going through ver versus sort of now it would be folks coming in and out in certain areas so if kids are sort of playing on that internal roadway network it it feels like there's less potential for conflict in the new design that not that that's the only thing you express but just mm -hmm. on that particular one that felt like a an, an improvement at least from from what I saw do you do you feel the same on that particular part of it yeah it's definitely okay. like right now it's very dangerous but yeah, yeah been, it's definitely an improvement with okay. the new plan yeah. okay that's a, and then and then um, the other one I wanted to ask because you also touched on a little bit about the the, uh, the safety and crime side of things in particular um, you know, and it's always tough because you know I can I can pull up the the crime map, which I do, and I try to re look at the stats. Do do you feel that right now, when you sort of think about the development you live in there and the space that you live in, do you feel is that it is uh, a high crime area at all, or is it? A, do you feel safe? I, I just wanted to get a sense from you right now, sort of as the the current feeling of someone living there. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually um, walk and I take the bus and I ride my bike, so. Um, it definitely feels like it's getting more, there's more criminal activity happening. There's more um, just, you know, just people on the streets and things. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, during the day, definitely I feel safe, but at night it's definitely yeah. sketchy, so. Do you feel that's, uh, and it's always tough to, to you know, figure out or, or get a sense of it. Do, do you think it's originating sort of from the, spa the, the place where you live or is it, coming from out and about and that's you know you're relatively close to a transit center you're close mm -hmm. to a major mall um, so do you think it's is it coming from that into where you live or is it coming from where you live in into and you're just seeing a rise in that in the time that you've been there I think it's just you know um, I'm just seeing that criminal perspective or that it's it's coming out of the downtown and okay. it's spreading outside so as you said it's you know, we're near a mall, we're near um, the transit center, the library. Um, so I just see it coming from outside in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and that, that's always the, you know, it's a struggle we're dealing with now, but I wanted to get a sense of sort of where, where you felt that was, that was originating from. Um, okay. I think that's all of my questions. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Now, Councilor Salvador, can you take the chair, please? Yes, I have the chair. Uh, I do have questions related to the safety that you have raised, uh, Summer and Dylan. Uh, I don't know if I can ask these questions. Uh, maybe I'll go to legal. Can I like? Can I ask questions around like we? How we make our communities safe by investing? Yes, in, sa in safe communities and redevelopment and how the two work together is totally appropriate. Okay, got point. it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So when this council got elected, the police budget was about $407 million and tax levy supported, right? Now that budget stands at $433 million. That's 27%, 27, uh, I think about $27 million increase, right? Roughly around that. And they're hiring more police officers. Province is stepping in. Are you seeing a visible? Are you seeing a difference in, uh, say, from last year to this year, in in, in presence of police officers, perceptions of safety? Are you seeing things improving? I think from that perspective, I am seeing more peace officers. Okay. So that is comforting to see that. Um, I'm not necessarily seeing it like at the like you know, with less crime and less sort of visible um, criminal activity and just. So are you seeing more peace officers yeah. or police officers? Peace officers. Peace officers, yeah. so I see, okay. Less police, more peace, I think. I see, yeah. okay. I know they're hiring, which is, mm -hmm. I know they have another class coming up, so they've been backfilling the vacancies as well because mm -hmm. they had about 100 police officers that uh, they had funding for, but they were not able to uh, quickly hire now with additional funding from the city, additional funding from uh, the province, they'll be able to add close to, I ended um, probably 200 additional police, uh, police officers. So to what I'm trying to understand that hopefully with those resources, safety will, Im will improve, but at the same time, we gotta continue to build the city for mm -hmm. people who are moving here, right? Mm -hmm. So just trying to understand uh, your, uh, the safety concerns, but at the same time, 
the need for housing. Mm -hmm. right? if well, you have I just feel like, you know, there has to be a balance. You uh -huh. know, I feel like this plan is going to be too far in the extreme of densification. Mm -hmm. Just personally speaking, I feel like it's not the right balance. Okay. But that's just my perspective. Yeah. 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 Oh, got it. And you're a tenant there, right? And uh, I'm a tenant. Yeah, I've been there for three and a half years. And uh, you know, would are you one of those tenants that might be at risk of displacement? Like how is your? Well, I, I'm concerned with mis what Mr. Appleyard said earlier about the subsidies because um, the the apartment building I live in is go it's going to be the only structure left standing. So yeah. it's the three story apartment building, and it's for people um, who are on disabilities, and we do get a subsidy. Um, which is really important to all the tenants in the building. So, you know, that it's a concern if that's going to be taken away or um, mm. it just seems like their plan is not straightforward. Is so. the subsidy to, it comes to you or subsidy goes to the, uh, to, to the building owner? The subsidy well, you're eligible for? They tell us that it, the subsidy comes from them. So, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. got it, got it. Mm -hmm. And have you had conversations about like how you will be accommodated? Well, uh, they don't typically, they're not very communicative, let's just put it that way. So um, I don't know where that stands, but based on what he said, it is a concern. Okay, we can definitely raise those que questions on your behalf to the, uh, uh, to the, to the applicant uh, and when we get into new information. Uh, so yeah, if we could just, um, you know, in, just somehow keep the subsidies in place because there's such a need for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, you know, just... Yeah, just yeah. consider that going yeah. forward. We, we will ask that question to, uh, to the applicant. My understanding would be they'll remain in place because those are government subsidies, right? And uh, I don't they, think they're government. I uh, think what they've told me is they're private, so I don't know okay. how that works. Hmm. But, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll ask those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for, for, you. for joining us and, uh, uh, and also to you and also to Denise for, for, for joining us. Really appreciate that. Uh, with that, I will take the chair back. Return the chair. Yeah, okay. Um, so that concludes the questions to both of you. Uh, now we're going to go to questions to administration. Yeah. Councilor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a lot of questions to administration. Um, in the, the DC, it does talk about a food establishment, beverage. I know that there's concerns from community about the, that being a, a, like a bar or something like that. I know that's not the intent of the applicant. Is there any other way that it could be written in the direct control to provide more certainty? So, <clears throat> cause like it's talked about like being an ice cream shop or something like that. It, it would just be the general definition of that use. Um, we did hear that concern during engagement that, that a bar was a concern. That actually was a use that was permitted within sub area B. Because we heard that concern, that was removed. Okay, so how it's written right now in the DC1 doesn't allow for that discretion? It does not I, allow for a bar period. It doesn't, but a, like a pub, for example. Like I, a food and drink establishment. I don't know. You, the primary purpose of that use would not be the consumption of alcohol. Okay, the primary, okay, perfect. Okay, that was my, I wanted to do that one. Not the, the biggest question, but I knew it would be a quick question. Um, I think one of the things I'm really grappling with, and I guess I'm going to go to legal first, or maybe Ms. Petron, I don't know, is we haven't approved the district plans but we have draft district plans in place and a just draft district policy. Am I, how, how do I interface that with this conversation today? I'd be careful with wording. We don't have district plans in draft in place. They are, they are being worked well, on. They will, they will come before you. The, the drafts are public. The drafts are public, yes. That's what I meant. So there is some persuasive quality to those documents that you can look at and see if this is a vision you like but they don't really have much of a factor on this until they've at least come to you. Once, once those have come before council and either have a few readings or are sent back or whatever else happens with those, then it has more persuasive quality on, even though it won't have been passed yet. In the interim, they're there. You can look at them. You can see that for consistency of where you're trying to see the city go. Yeah. But I wouldn't treat it like you would a normal statutory plan at this point. Okay. Um, 
I guess, to administration, when you assess an application, how are you or are you considering the district plans? Because I know it's, it's, it's zoning in further than the city plan. So the st city plan already exists as a statutory. I, I, can, you tr can you walk me through how, if at all, that's influencing your support or non-support for any given application? Influencing it, it no. The, the primary focus of the primary document that was used to review this application was the city plan. It is statutory, it is approved. Um, we're certainly aware of district plans and, and we certainly are looking at them to, to get an understanding of how these applications um, will uh, conform or not conform in a post-district planning world once this council has had the opportunity to weigh in on that. Um, but for the time being, no. I would say the, the primary policy land use influence on this application was the city plan. So if, let's say, something is approved today that's counter to what is the public draft policy out there, does then district plan, and this maybe is more to Kim Petron, does district planning then go back and amend before it comes to public hearing? Uh, no, so there, there are two sort of separate processes in that regard, um, and, you, and you can have one that conflicts ahead of time with the other. Um, that, that vision for district plans that will be presented uh, later this year to Council, you, you'll be looking to debate and decide on that. Uh, so right now it is a gray period, but we, we exist in gray periods yeah. a lot of the time, uh, whether we're ahead of policy or um, through uh, different revisions of city plan or, or what have you. Uh, so right now, uh, there is district plans draft outside, oh, right now, yeah. uh, as Stuart, Mr. Carlisle said, uh, we are aware of those and how this application fits into there. Uh, but it doesn't influence our decision in terms of how it impacts or how it aligns with city plan, which is the approved document right now. But this approved document still city plans identifies this area as a district node, correct? Correct. And so is the district, so the, but in the district policy, it has some parameters for what it identifies as a district node, such as low to mid rise under 10 story, uh, such as along arterials for high development, those kind of things. Um, walk me, th I'm out of time, but I'll come back for a second round, sorry. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we just want to pick up on some of the questions and concerns that were raised by speakers related to um, street safety. So uh, I guess first just wanted to clarify the intersection of uh, 135 and 114th Ave. Um, I think it was mentioned that that is a candidate, candidate for signalization. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and I guess what, walk me through what that process looks like. Um, is that sort of in the interim as the development builds out and population increases in the area? Are we talking medium term? How does that work? So how we have assessed that is uh, we have looked at the current condition, which does not warrant a signal. But then uh, looking at uh, 1.5 million population where we are seeing a cumulative impact of overall population increase in addition to this uh, uh, development. Uh, looking at that, it does qualify to uh, have some level of uh, enhanced control uh, in order to um, provide safe passage for that desired line that you see from east to west. And uh, further to that, what we have also done as is uh, within the DC, given that this development is longer term, it's not going to be fully developed in five years, rather it's longer than that. So we have uh, a regulation that uh, creates a touch point and other uh, checkpoint rather to look at uh, where, what the traffic patterns are. Uh, so <clears throat> you can call it an additional analysis that needs to be done at a 50% build out of mm -hmm. this uh, site. And that will further solidify some of the timings that are, uh, that whether it's really needed right away or <clears throat> it's uh, further long uh, apart. Okay, that's really helpful. So it's not that, you know, we'd be waiting until the completion of the entire development. There's that midpoint check-in. Okay, fantastic. Um, I am also wondering, you know, that's, that's 
one intersection, um, but we also heard from the speaker that there's concerns just sort of around kind of the periphery of the site and given that it's so close to park space, um, folks are often, and kids in particular, are often running back and forth. Um, yeah, I guess how, how can we factor that into this conversation given that it is sort of a site specific conversation but it of course has influence on, on the surrounding use of the site? I, I would just term that as an ongoing process to, to basically do whatever uh, initiatives we have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, um, uh, through Strava Safe Mobility um, uh, that we have done uh, uh, street labs project mm -hmm. not too far away from uh, this site uh, uh, within Sherbrooke and Dover Court neighborhood. Uh, last year, uh, along 122 Avenue, some speed um, uh, tables were installed. And uh, that, that is, again, one of the things to basically uh, control and uh, be more uh, proactively uh, looking after the speeding issues. Um, as far as this neighborhood in, in its current state, uh, we, uh, we have uh, recent traffic counts that were done as part of the traf uh, transportation assessment. And that doesn't, uh, the, uh, that it, it does reflect uh, low volumes along 114 Avenue. Um, uh, the highest volumes that we found were closer to Growth Road at uh, uh, one, uh, four, uh, 114 uh, because of uh, the commercial uh, component and also the signalization at that intersection. So another thing that we found through the assessment was an imbalanced use of 114 Avenue versus 115 because mm -hmm. 114 is signalized and 115 is not. So down the road, as we see that uh, those other intersections do qualify to be signalized, it will further, I would suggest that it will further uh, provide a better dispersion of traffic and not just focus on one. Right, okay, okay, thank you so much for that answer. Um, and just uh, looping back to one thing you said around the street labs, is that something that can be initiated by uh, community members if there's an interest? That's correct. Okay, um, that could be an interesting opportunity. Uh, really quickly on waste, um, waste management was brought up as an issue that currently exists. Um, and just looking through the DC, uh, it, it mentions collection and loading areas. Uh, can someone just speak to that and how that might influence um, or, or potentially um, help with the current waste collection issues? Yeah, so the location of those is something that's going to have to be considered uh, as each development permit comes in. The location of those is going to be something that that waste is going to look at. Our transportation folks are going to look at it to make sure that it's in an, an optimal location, safety being one of those components. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the detailed look by, by waste and our transportation folks will be at that development permit stage. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Stevenson. Thank you. That um, that covered one of my main questions, just around waste. Um, just wondering, too, just in terms of the choice to to go with the DC. I recognize that you know when sites are developing over time, DCs aren't necessarily the most flexible tool. Um, but just confirming, my my assumption would be that that DC was to ensure, uh, you know, some of those internal circulation pieces that we can't do through through standard zoning. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Um, we, it was really important to us that, that for, for a site this large, it wasn't mm -hmm. acting as a, a barrier to, to connectivity uh, to some of those more important features of the neighborhood like Coronation Park, like Westmount uh, Shopping Center and the Transit Center. Um, and so, yes, those are assurances that can only be provided through a direct control zone, not standard zoning. Great. Yeah, and I think I think that connectivity was, was well done. And, and just wanted to follow up on the... Um, the internal safety question as well. So again, what I'm seeing in the DC, there are some uh, some cross sections that are provided that sort of show, you know, separated sidewalks um, for pedestrians. So so just want to maybe just clarify. So so these are for the multimodal corridor um, and the okay. So all internal roadways are going to have that cross section that has a separate walking path? The correct, yeah. Okay, and that's excellent. And that's not the case right now, correct? There's sort of internal roadways, but they don't have sidewalks adjacent to them. I believe that's the case. Okay, great. So so in terms of that safety, there is that provision uh, to ensure that that's provided. Okay, great. I didn't have any further questions. Thanks very much. 
Thank you so much, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Thanks for the information. A few more questions. Just on the, on the traffic safety piece, I wanted to get a sense, and I actually don't know how we do this. So I know there is a playground zone that runs from, uh, you know, sort of halfway along the development along 114th Ave through the bend. Why does it start there versus, say, at the beginning of that intersection, considering there is still sports fields, albeit a fenced sports field? There is that. Is that the determining factor right now that you have a fence sports field that that doesn't trigger the playground zone piece? Councillor, great question. I'll uh, I don't have uh, uh, an exact understanding why it is that way. It, uh, you are right that it is halfway uh, yeah. away from the intersection. Uh, this could be something we can take back. Yeah, and, uh, I, you know, I wonder if we are, you know, if this is approved and there's going to be, I mean, there's already a lot of families or could be even more families with the number of bedrooms and it's it's one giant park that runs the entirety of the space and and I wonder if folks, you know, you know can sort of gun it off that four-way stop right now and, and then you have to slow down but halfway, you know, what's, is it just that we've always done it that way and in fact maybe we need a little nuance to that. Okay, well, I'll, I appreciate you'll, you'll look at that separate. Um, I wanted to maybe go to Mr. Pollock and just to pick off a little bit, uh, pick up where uh, Councillor Rutherford was on the district plan piece. Um, not unlike a, I guess where, where potentially the issue is, is that the draft district policies, as she was mentioning, would suggest that buildings of this height might need to be more located towards an arterial road. And, and again, that, that's part of a, I guess the channel, like I, it's a large site. There's there's reasons why you would allow large buildings on a large site, but I don't actually know if the draft district policies reflect that reality, or am I misreading the definitions that are in that? No, you're correct. Uh, but also uh, within the district plans or the draft district plans now, there is some flexibility within there that allows uh, different site context to be in interpreted uh, to allow different uh, densities within it. And I think it's important to note that as district policies move forward, um, that exercise is not a, a site by site analysis of the entire city outlining what can happen in the future. Uh, it provides general guidelines, um, more descript guidelines than city plan, uh, but there's still within that process and with that planning, that ability to have certain uh, unique circumstances that will allow uh, for larger development and as demonstrated by the analysis uh, by Stuart and team, uh, the the context of this of being a big site next to a park, next to a transit station, next to uh, a mall, uh, several amenities, et cetera, that this site benefits um, from all of those and allows that density to be incorporated yeah. Uh, sensitively. Yeah, and, and, and I don't disagree, and, and I guess part of it, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to the to the uh, recent one, what, a couple months ago uh, for the Belgravia McKernan one, and, and so I'm just wondering if, you know, I've heard that you say you're not necessarily using that to inform your recommendation, and I appreciate why, because the policy hasn't been approved. There's still more work to do before it actually comes before council. At the same time, if we're noticing a couple of examples like this, is there a need to make sure we're not, um, you know, th there are unique characteristics, but, but there are a number of potentially larger sites where you might want to have that nuance going forward, and so how are we capturing that? And, and I, Appreciate Mr. Johnson's looking at me, so I'm, I may be getting a little ahead of time on the district planning conversation, but but I also know that people are going to use that to as part of this conversation. So we, we are aware um, of the feedback on district plans and uh, maybe some of the shortcomings there, um, but yeah, not to get into any details uh, yet, but just know that we are uh, looking at those okay. opportunities uh, within the district planning process. Okay. All right, uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Mayor Sophia. Thank you. Can you move the second round? Uh, I'd be happy to move a second round. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Please vote. Um, yes. 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 We're just missing one couple votes. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I said yes. Thank you. And Councillor Wright. Councillor Wright, are you with us? You will mark her absent. No. We have all the votes. Okay, display the votes, please. 
that is carried. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'm going to stick I, with, with the line of questioning on district plans for a minute, and then I'll have some questions on the design committee pieces as well. Um, okay, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with this, and I'm turning to legal for a second. Because one of the things I'm hearing a lot in, in the community as, as a governor on this side is, is disillusionment. Like, we have these things, then sometimes it seems like when the city plan is effective, we say it aligns with city plan. And then when we have something like district plans where it doesn't fully align, well, we say, but this is contextual and site-specific. And I'm, I, I'm feeling that sentiment in the community. And so while we don't have the district plans have, haven't come towards public hearing yet. What I see in the draft and what the public has seen and what this site allows are, are, are different. So how do I navigate that in the context of this public hearing? Councilor, Can you help a, me? <laughs> it's a great question and, and it's a complicated one. So I, you know, it, it's totally understandable where the community comes at from this. We have to keep in mind that a district plan at this point has not been vetted through a statutory public hearing process and has no level of endorsement from city council at this point. And until that happens, it would be wrong for administration to use that as a guide because there is no direction currently offered. It may show up here and council may say, this is not where we want this to go and send it back. We don't know that until it comes. Um, there are some indications through it being a committee and whatnot, and that's why it does have some persuasive quality to you. But there are two factors that matter. One is relevance, clearly be relevant, and the second is weight. How much weight should you put on it? And my argument is at this point, it should be given very little weight until okay. it has some level of endorsement, even if, the, even if that's just uh, the public hearing process and some input from council, or a first or a second reading, even if it isn't passed, then it has more and more weight to it. Does that Yeah, help? so what, regardless of the decision that happens today, would your advice be to, I guess, back pocket this example when district planning comes forward for debate? I think this would be a wise contextual discussion that would help you with the district planning discussion. I also point out, I know in the district plan, in the drafts that show it does talk about direct controls that already have been passed, will not be subject to those. So they have contemplated this level of element in there. But this is a great contextual conversation that would lead to that discussion. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll leave it there because I'll speak to it when I get to that point. Um, you heard my questioning to the applicant around the design committee uh, talking about ground oriented development along 114. It doesn't seem to be, uh, it's silent in the, the D D DC one to that. I guess just administration's thoughts on, on that would be appreciated. I'd, uh, I'd like to draw your attention, if I can, to, to subsection 10.1 of the DC. Um, so this is where it defines what's referred to as residential amenity frontage. So it's within this regulation that, again, granted the applicant wasn't fully willing to commit to all ground-oriented units along that edge, but you can see in here the other things that they are willing to commit to in addition to those ground-oriented units. So that includes transparent glazing, private outdoor amenity areas, and residential entry features. So these are all things that we would consider to be uh, really lending themselves to, to an appropriate interface along, the, along that edge. But still meeting that um, balance because what I heard from the applicant is like, because DC, DCs for those in the public that might not understand, they really lock in uh, a site to a very specific form of development. So I guess the, I, my question to administration is how did you strike that balance with knowing this is a 10 to 15 year project, we don't even have necessarily all the grant funding or requirements from other orders of government, uh, the applicant doesn't. How, how have you written this in such a way, maybe that will help shore up this for me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the things that we know that, that, that we want, so for example, we did focus quite quite a bit onto 115th Avenue, understanding that the interface between this development and that being its most sensitive edge would be of utmost importance to not only us, but the community. Um, and so there is that guarantee there. The rest of the edges of the development are relatively flexible. They've been written that way in the DC, and that is, to your point, in an effort to strike that balance between getting what we know are, are the strongest features of this site, 
but also allowing there to be, um, you know, some some changes and things to occur that won't that won't uh, have the applicant have to come back to council and ask for permission again. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions to uh, administration. At this time, I'll ask if council members have any questions to uh, administration, to proponents, uh, to opponents on any new information arising out of the previous conversation. I do. Council Salvador? Yeah. Uh, this is to the proponent. Um, you heard from um, one of your tenants the the concerns around transition and the and maintaining the subsidy that she or they are they are currently able to uh, able to access right. So just want to get your thoughts. First of all, how will that subsidy be maintained? and the source of subsidy and how transition will impact uh, uh, this particular tenant that you know took time to uh, come and, uh, and share their concerns with us. So the, um, the, our subsidy program works uh, in a very unique manner. So we ask government for capital to build, but we don't ask government for year over year subsidies to support our tenants. We take the near the profit off the near market units and we use it to subsidize the other units. And so last year we self-funded $476,475 of subsidy. Didn't come from the government, came from us. Um, and so our plans, as we discussed uh, with the three sessions we held directly with the tenants that the tenant in question was unable to attend is that we have uh, fully intent to keep those subsidy programs active in the manner that they uh, exist today. The challenge is we move into the new grant programs. Um, they're going to force us to put some new processes and admin around those programs. But for the building, um, the 29 unit apartment infill building that will be staying on site, that program I don't see any future changes to. Uh, so it might, might also say future changes or no? So I'm just, I missed the last part, Rob. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we plan to continue the program in that building in a very similar manner as it is today. Okay. The administration will change a bit, but the subsidy will remain. So the current client tenants who are getting the subsidy now, whatever, you know, the way you're figuring it out with capital grants, getting from the governments then using the cost reduction and using those savings to provide that uh, that subsidy uh, what i want to know in a simple in a simple way is that the, the your cur current tenants will continue to receive the subsidy they're now receiving right? am i under, am i understanding that correctly that is our intent the challenge is that as we apply to grant programs we have to sign agreements on those grants that might change the way some of those subsidy programs operate, yeah. but we still intend to put in the same levels of subsidy that we're putting in today. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, we would encourage uh, our, uh, uh, you know, your tenant to uh, continue to engage with you and uh, uh, and because that, that window never closes, right? They're your tenants and you continue to engage with them. Yeah, yeah, we, we plan to continue to engage with the tenants, um, all of the ones that are uh, in buildings where they're having to move. Um, we have regular communications with them. Okay. Okay, I'll leave the rest of the questions around waste uh, and uh, the two others. I know if they're intending to ask them, or maybe we can ask that, like we heard, we heard the concern around, uh, you know, waste management uh, on site. Can you comment on that? Uh, I'd love to. Um, I agree with uh, the tenant completely on this one. We have zero control over waste management because it's run by the city. Uh, and I, I hate to kick that whole pack of you guys. It is it is a big challenge with the population we serve. Um, and it's something we'd love to work with the city on. There's some better forms of um, waste containment 
waste containers out there that would serve the site much better called mollusks. Um, we're hoping that the city approves their use going forward. Um, but that's part of the discussion as we get into the development permit stage. Got it. So it's a, uh, you would like to more frequent, frequent pickup of uh, waste would help or maybe bigger containers would help? Like what is? Well, well, if you're a single mom in your unit and you have say a 10 year old and a baby, you ask the 10 year old to take the garbage to the garbage can, but they can't toss it into a bin that's 48 inches high. Mm. So they leave it in front. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I think that's a very important, we will, I think very important uh, uh, things you're raising and the tenant is here is raising because how do you, how do we apply the, those kind of unique equity lenses to, uh, uh, to the services that we, that we provide. No, thank you for, for sharing that with us. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Rutherford next and I'll take the chair back. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have too many lingering questions. I guess just one that I would be remiss I didn't ask in my first round. We talked about three bedroom units, but uh, I, I, I didn't ask about accessible units because I think that one of the speakers in opposition brought up a good point about, you know, three stories and stairs for, for seniors or, or anybody with any kind of mobility. So could you, could you just speak to the plan around accessible units? Yeah, so the taller buildings uh, will be um, like the, the three-story buildings along 115th Ave will require stairs, but the rest of the buildings on site will have an accessible component to them. And we're working out how many units that is and what it looks like, but part of the grant funding requires that. As well, those buildings have elevators, so there isn't a need to go up and down the stairs. Will there be a common space in the build in those buildings? The current building under design um, doesn't have one. The community space is more oriented around the parks and the playgrounds yeah. and the media gardens, but interior to the building, uh, we haven't planned one um, on the current building. If there's a demand for it, it's something we look at and there's uh, possibility for it as we get to about the middle of the site where we have the commercial space yeah no I've um I've I've had some pretty insightful walk arounds with some folks with disabilities recently and one of the things that came up is that when they have a disability and they're in an affordable housing unit it's often like a one bedroom very small and it doesn't allow them to you know, have family over for, for uh, a gathering at, Chris, at a holiday. Um, and they talked a lot about how something where they have a, even if they have a smaller, more accessible unit, but a place where they can, can host, like I think about how a lot of condos have those kind of like, you can book out. Um, so that's just something that I, I wanted to, to bring to your attention as a, as a thought and bring that voice forward because uh, I thought it was pretty insightful and, and something that um, we might want to consider in this project. I think it would be a great addition. Just putting it out there as a suggestion. Uh, I appreciate that. We've actually built that into the building, uh, the apartment building that's going to be staying on site right now um, because that has studios and one bedrooms. But everything else we're building is going to be two bedroom or greater. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, perfect. And I'm just going to look at my notes for one last well I, that is oh one other final question with the parking underground i know you're not how many unit how many parking stalls will there be um I don't have the number at the at the top. We, uh, if I can help you out, Rob, we have uh, 851 parking stalls okay. below ground level, and that would include um, any uh, required parking for commercial premises, daycare parking, and that's still to be worked out at the. Uh, okay, so the, the daycare level. parking is is because that's it, another it concern be, I heard from residents about mm -hmm. the lack of parking for the daycare. Very specific requirements for Edmonton for daycare parking that will be met. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you so much, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions to the 
uh, to everyone on new information. So uh, what we can do, probably close the public hearing, then uh, uh, then after that we can come back to, uh, if I'm pretty sure some members may want to speak to this, right? So uh, can someone move the closing of the public hearing? Yeah, I'm, I'll move closure of the public hearing on item 312. Second. Second by Councillor Knack. So moved by Councillor Rutherford, second by Councillor Knack. Please vote for uh, closing the public hearing. Councillor Wright is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried, and we'll take a break now, and we'll come back to uh, deal with the rest of the proceedings on uh, uh, moving the first, second, and third reading. Okay. okay.
Okay, we are back and would like to call this meeting back to order. We'll do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Council Salvador. Good afternoon. Council Cartmel. Good afternoon. Council Rice. Good afternoon. And Council Jans. Council Jans. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Go. So everyone is here, and we were we closed the public hearing on three point one two. Now to speak. All right, who would like to speak to this item? To this bylaw? I think I have to put first, I have to put. Oh yeah, yeah, well, uh, we, we've, we've got to, oh, yeah, we haven't put the first, yeah, first. Can you move the first reading, Councilor? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to put first reading on the floor. Second. Thank you, now we speak. We have first reading on the floor. Anyone wish to speak? Councilor Stevenson. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to speak briefly in support of this this application. Um, you know, this is uh, this I think is a very exciting opportunity to to realize many of our city plan and city building goals. Um, it's providing more housing options within close proximity to a, a great number of services, um, uh, and really goes above and beyond in my mind in terms of providing. Uh, open space and, and on-site amenities for the residents, which I hope will be enjoyed by the community as a whole. Um, I, I think that, you know, hearing, hearing from current tenants and, and neighbors as well uh, is always such an important part of the process in terms of understanding some of those uh, local impacts. Um, I think, you know, I think change will inevitably come with, with challenges and also recognizing that this will be a phased project over, over many years. Um, my hope is that, you know, as other neighborhoods have experienced that the addition of new housing options uh, enriches a community, adds more vibrancy, is able to support, support more local amenities as well. Um, uh, my hope is that, that that continues to be realized as this project is built out. So grateful to the applicants for bringing it forward and, and very pleased to be supporting this development that will bring much needed affordable housing to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I also want to, yeah, take a moment to thank the speakers who uh, were with us today and uh, who took time to voice their perspectives and engage in this process um, and to the applicant for coming forward with this application. Um, I do agree with administration's assessment that this rezoning is in alignment with city plan and that it is in an excellent location for increased density uh, given its proximity to various amenities as well as transit. Um, what excites me about this rezoning is that it will help deliver much needed affordable housing in our city uh, and importantly three plus bedroom units uh, to provide larger families an opportunity to live in a fantastic community that is um, not only close to uh, transit and amenities but some fantastic green space and parks as well. I really appreciate the attention that was given to how this development will interface with the surrounding area, uh, specifically along 115th Avenue, uh, but also the attention to detail when it comes to uh, some of the multimodal pathways throughout the site. Uh, I did appreciate the points that were brought up by the speakers related to traffic safety, uh, as this is a critical part of building walkable, vibrant, and welcoming neighborhoods. I was reassured by the answers we received from administration that there are a number of opportunities, both in the immediate term through uh, programs like Street Labs, uh, as well as in the longer term through upgrades and signalization to improve traffic safety in the area. Um, also very pleased to hear that there are opportunities at the development permit stage to improve the current situation surrounding waste management. Um, so for, for all of those reasons, I am uh, happy to support this rezoning and really appreciated the discussion we all had today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councilor Silver, Councilor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, so for me, I, I'm going to support this application uh, for a few reasons. So I think the, the first is, and obviously at this point, we're, we're well aware of just how quickly we're growing the need for affordable housing for, well, housing in general, but on top of that, affordable housing units, uh, it's critical. We, we have to use sites like this, which are well connected to 
amenities, transit, uh, green spaces, and and move forward on those. And I think that's that's one important piece. But we shouldn't do it simply because it increases density. Um, uh, that's well important and, and addresses what is a major housing crunch right now. I think this is a really good designed uh, development. Uh, you know, I know we're not trying to do a lot of direct control zones uh, as part of the whole re re review of the zoning bylaw. Um, but I think this is a, a really reasonable use of a direct control zone, um, in particular in proximity to the other neighbors as, as it's a large site. And so it's a fairly large scale change. So I really like what we, what's, what's been brought forward and what's been proposed. I think it gives uh, enough certainty that I, I feel comfortable about what that means for the neighbors surrounding. Uh, and at the same time provides enough flexibility that so hopefully they don't need to come back if the world changes in five years and they need to make some adjustments as, as time goes on. Um, similar to, to my colleagues, appreciate there's some ways to address some of those immediate traffic safety concerns. I think the changes in this, this, new, develop, this new design um, will make it much more safe for people to be in, in that site and enjoying the green spaces and amenities there and hope that means more uh, more street hockey games and more other things like that because uh, we actually don't often see a lot of that on our on our streets because it's not the most safe place to be. Um, so I actually think the design here is, is going to allow for, for a bit more of a safe, a safe approach so that kids can be out and about in the community there, also traveling across to the other green spaces. Uh, the final thing I just wanted to touch on, and it's, it's one we, we get from time to time, and we heard it today from uh, our, our two speakers in opposition around that concern around crime and, and is there that connectivity between um, uh, higher density and more crime. And, and uh, I know as Councillor Stevenson talked, touched on it earlier, and I think what we've seen over the years is that um, while more people might in fact mean more crime, that might not be more crime on a per capita basis. Right? So we see more densely populated areas actually often with lower crime rates overall than we do um, more sparsely populated areas. And, and so I, I flag that because I think that's sometimes a concern. I, you know, I, I have the benefit of having, as I'm sure Mayor Sohi does, you know, we, we've been able to see through some of the things that we approved 10 or 15 years ago that are larger scale, higher density developments. And that fear that has existed has never actually materialized. Um, because oftentimes the reinvestment in these sites bring about um, a greater pride and a greater sense of ownership and a greater desire to be part of that community, um, even if there are folks that might be just students who are only going to be there for a couple of years, they're going to a space that, that they... Um, that they really want to be at, and I find that actually helps change things. It's oftentimes the the rundown spaces, and, and I appreciate that Brentwood's not going to be that type of landlord, but I've seen you know rundown apartment buildings that uh, have a, a landlord or a property owner that lives outside the city that they're often the ones that don't care and don't take uh, time and attention to to actually invest in. Um, the services and amenities and the and the upkeep that that I think people expect, and that can sometimes generate more um, challenging situations. So for me, I, I'm actually think this is this is a really great investment. I think it's a perfect location. I, I know Westmount Mall has been going through a lot of different change, and and I think the influx of people could really help. Uh, the ongoing revitalization efforts in that mall too, because while there's some good things happening, I also think there's been there's been a loss of a few major tenants, and and I think having a lot more people closer to it could really help with that ongoing work. So, I actually think this is a, a, an excellent development. I'm really excited to see just the the sheer number of multi bedroom units that we'll see. I, I don't think we've ever had a, a rezoning application in my time on council that's had this many three and four bedroom units proposed ever. Um, and, and at a time when we're always asked about that, I, I think this is one that's finally going to deliver on, on something we've been hoping for in the city for some time. So I'm very excited to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack, Councillor Salvador. Yeah. Very quickly, not to, uh, not to repeat what my colleagues have said, but just to highlight, uh, we desperately need more affordable housing in our city. So having an application come forward that increases on that side the affordable housing units by four times, I think really adds to the, the stock that we badly need. That's one. The second is, no, the infrastructure already exists in that neighborhood. There's a close proximity to West Mount Transit Center. Rec Center is right there. Library is right there. 
the green space is right there, the shopping mall is right there. So this really fits into the local living, 15-minute community, and absolutely important. And uh, I think that really impacts people's affordability. People living close to amenities don't have to drive long distance. They may not have to buy that first car or second car. In some cases, uh, if family is large, if they don't have access to public transit, people end up, end up buying a third car. So I think having this site, I mean, having where the housing will be built, I think will definitely not, I believe will make living more affordable for people who are going to make home in, in those, uh, um, uh, those uh, I can, uh, 750 new, new units. It's, I think it's also important from an environmental sustainability point of view. We all know, I think we have heard that uh, if we can accommodate a family with an existing neighborhood, their footprint, environmental footprint, is much smaller than the same family size being accommodated in, in a suburban suburban area. So, on a, it help us move forward on the on the on the on the on the sustainability goal. So it's you know touches on all the things that we want to achieve in the in the city plan on affordability, sustainability, affordable housing. Uh, local living and local amenities. I think uh, uh, we, we need to see more of these uh, uh, applications come our way for council's consideration. Yeah. As far as crime, I think your councilor Nack and everyone else asked, right? Like I, I have sat through very contentious public hearings during my time on council and here, uh, you know, this conflation that high density brings crime has no fact whatsoever. It's not that what it has no relationship whatsoever, right? And actually, high density neighborhoods are probably more safer in some cases, right? So I think there's no relationship. I have heard this argument from people, but it's not the it, it's it's not backed by by evidence. I also want to commend the uh, the applicant for working with the uh, existing tenants and ensuring that their needs will be accommodated uh, as development takes place. And uh, and we heard that from Greece by development as well. I think somehow we were not able to communicate that as effectively. So anyone listening that we displaced uh, affordable housing in Greece by, we did not, right? And neither are we doing in this case, right? So uh, so my friend, I won't name names, right? But please, you can go hear that conversation as well, if you wish to do so. Thank you so much. I'll, with that, I'll go to, I'll take the chair back and go to Councilor Jans to speak. Thank you. Um, I too will be supporting this this development. Uh, I want to speak at just so many great comments made by my colleagues, and it's so exciting that we get to have these robust conversations about building the future of our city. When I look, we are going from 236 units to an increase up to 738 units. And that's really exciting. That's, uh, we're essentially tripling the number of people who have an opportunity to live in one of the most beautiful parts of our city that is right close to a brand new leisure center uh, with Peter Hemingway and the new triathlon center, the new amenities that we're bringing into that community. Uh, neighbors who are gonna have a, a wonderful public library next door. Neighbors who are going to be able to attend Ross Shep. And a few years ago, Ross Shep High School actually received, it was one of the few high schools to receive a complete engine overhaul, uh, so to speak, from the government of Alberta. Uh, so this high school is here to stay. And they redid the guts, they redid the 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 wires that like this is going to be a a a uh, a high school that will be here for you know the next century. And to to know that we are investing in more housing and more families and more opportunities in this area that's close to a new rec center, close to a new school, close to a new library, close to a transit center. And I, uh, I'm i not sure if our speaker earlier was aware, but we've seen a 27% increase in people taking transit. It's, it's not enough to say people are not taking transit. People are taking transit and more people are taking transit each each and every day. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that, but we're seeing a dramatic increase 
And when you can have that location efficiency, when you can live in a home with a grocery store that's just steps away, uh, when you have transit direct to downtown and other destinations, when you can wander down Groat Road and get to Government House and the Groat Road Ravine and the River Valley, this is an absolutely beautiful community. It's a wonderful opportunity of how we can use our land more effectively, that we're not cannibalizing farmland. We're not cutting down wetlands and trees in suburban areas. This is the kind of place where you can live, you can raise a family, and um, you can retire. It's 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 got everything, and it's right there. And you can go and visit your your grandparents in the senior center just next door too. So I'm um, I'm very excited to see it. I'm very excited to see the proposal. I hope that we can think creatively about more of these um, underutilized areas in our city and and. Uh, uh, truly build up and not out because there's no other way we're going to meet our climate goals, our affordability goals, and our city plan goals if we don't. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rutherford, to close. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all the speakers that came out today. I know yes, this this environment is as as gracious as our mayor is and as much as we try to make it welcoming is is an intimidating place and so i want to acknowledge the for those both virtual and uh who came in person how much it is appreciated and and i know there is this sentiment this disillusion um that i heard come across from those speakers and i've heard it in the community too quite frankly especially in this neighborhood uh, around this project um and so I appreciate those that still take the time and know that, that your voices are important and they are heard. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I find, I've said it before, I've said it many times, I find the public uh, hearing process extremely frustrating because I'm a complex systems thinker and I have to only think about things in the context of land use. And there's so many other factors that I wish I could bring in often in these these conversations but we can't we have the question before us around these projects is is this a valid uh, a reasonable use for the land in front of us and in the, in the case of this parcel and it is it is a valid land use consideration as my I, i'm not going to reiterate a lot of what my colleagues already said in terms of 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 height and i think that i want to just you know kudos to the developer to Brentwood homes and, and everything. I think from a from a applicant perspective, this is a slam dunk. From a what we're grappling with as a municipality, I don't think it's such a home run actually. And I think I need to just take a few minutes to highlight that there was a lot of tension and I get that we're in the gray, but I'm not so convinced that this wouldn't have still been a supported application had district plans actually already passed. And what the district plan does say is that for high to medium density, it should be along arterial roads and that in a district node, that height of less than 10, so nine stories or less, is, is what would be in, you would see in that, in that district node, which is what this area is. And, and while those are minor, it, it's important to highlight because that kind of nuance change, when people see the district plans, they're not gonna say, okay, well, they're gonna see that as this is what I can expect in my neighborhood, full stop. And I'm very concerned about that. And so I'm going to back pocket it, as I mentioned before, for, the, for future conversations. Um, I will take it uh, with a very light weighting as advised by legal in this conversation, but I, I hope Kim's hearing me, I hope others that you know, for that district plan, I, that this this is one that really flags for me, that it doesn't align with what your policy says. Um, and yet, I, I do believe that this would have still be supported no matter what, because it's a great project. Um, there are mixed perspectives on this project from the community. So I found it really hard to, you know, as the representative for this area, uh, use that as, as a strong pusher in driver in either, direction um, because I, there's a lot of strong vocal support for it and there was a lot of strong vocal opposition but I would say that in the interactions that I had with residents and even the community league recently submitted a position statement as neutral because they also acknowledge the mixed feelings so 
I do want to say that you are heard, but that there is quite a diversity of perspectives on this project and community at this time. And so I will lean into that land use consideration component as my primary, my primary driver uh, on this. And lastly, in my last minute, I do want to highlight great, great comments from Councillor Jans about all of the amenities that exist. But I would also like to highlight that a lot of those amenities are at capacity. Uh, Raw Shep actually is already limiting the number of student enrollments that can go into that school. Um, the public library has been on the list for needing to be at capacity, is just below the one that we, Heritage Valley, that we just funded, but it didn't get funded. We have not funded the district master plan for the park at Coronation Park. So it's, we have all this development happening with no master plan. So there are a lot of things that are unfunded that this kind of development, if we keep seeing that in Woodcroft, which I'm sure we will because of where it's located and everything, we need to think about the infrastructure around that as well. So that's just something that I think is really important to, to shed light on. But otherwise, happy to support today. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So please vote on first reading. <clears throat> Well, apologies, uh, yes from me. Thank you, Councillor Tang. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Um, I'll move second reading. Second. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration for third reading. Second. Thank you. Please vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I will move third reading of Charter Bylaw 20793. Second. Okay, please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So 3.12 is dealt with. I have a couple of meetings starting at 2 o'clock, so I'm going to leave this meeting in the capable hands of Councillor Salvador. Excellent. Um, so next up on the agenda, we have items 3.13 and 3.14 selected by Councillor Stevenson. Um, would you care for a presentation, Councillor Stevenson? Yeah, I, I received, so we, we did hear this item at our last public hearing, and we did close public hearing, but I've been advised that we have sort of reopened public hearing at this point. Yeah, Councillor, with the start of this new meeting, it did reopen the public hearings that were on today's agenda, so maybe, a, you know, the brief process would be appropriate. Great. Sounds good. We'll hand it over to administration for a presentation. Good afternoon. This application was presented and discussed at the March 11, 2024 public hearing. The proposal is for text amendments to the Central McDougall Urban Village Special Area Zone to allow for temporary surface parking until December 31st, 2028. If approved, the temporary surface parking lots would be required to be upgraded from the current state to improve the appearance, safety, and functionality of the lots. This includes increased perimeter landscaping and pathways for people to move more easily through the site. Interior landscaped islands would not be required, and the intent is that paving would only have to occur at the vehicle access points to the lots. At the previous public hearing, Council postponed this item to allow for further comprehensive discussions on downtown surface parking lots to occur. These discussions occurred at the March 19th, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting. Administration continues to recommend approval of this application because it is a temporary use until redevelopment occurs and it includes improvements to increase the aesthetic, safety, and accessibility of the site. Thank you. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, now we do have a number of speakers. Um, I see Speaker Yolanda Liu is to answer questions only. Um, I'm just gonna check in to make sure everyone's here. Yolanda? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Tim Shipton, I see you don't have to answer questions only behind your name. So are you uh, hoping to give a presentation? Uh, yes, I am. Excellent. Yep. Um, and I'm going to just check in as well with Fabio uh, Gudarsi. Apologies for that pronunciation. I'm here. Excellent. I'm here. Perfect. Um, okay, Thanks. we'll turn it over to um, Speaker Shipton. You have uh, five minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to members of council uh, for your time today. It's good to be back in front of council to discuss this topic. Uh, I'm here representing OEG Sports and Entertainment to speak in support of the amendment to the Central McDougal Queen Mary Park ARP, the amendment to the Central McDougal um, Urban Village Zone. As you may recall, sorry, next slide. Um, as you may recall from previous presentations, the vision for those lands north of Rogers Place are to create a mixed use urban village that will include up to 2,500 residential units integrated with commercial and recreational opportunities, including options for student and other diverse housing options. This vision has been contemplated since the beginning of our development of ICE District to create a people oriented residential driven development to complement our sports and entertainment focused assets in phase one. The application in front of you today proposes to increase the time frame for the temporary surface parking uh, for another five years as our timeline timelines for development have been uh, drastically impacted uh, by the knock on effect from the pandemic we're seeing here in Edmonton and markets across North America, as well as other headwinds such as public safety concerns and a slow to recover uh, real estate market. Next slide, please. The plans for the urban village will be attractive to families and will mean more people make their home in the downtown core. Um, the village will be built through community partnerships between Cage Group, uh, governments, investors, developers, and other community stakeholders in order to get that vision right. Uh, Cage Group and OEGSE hope to work collaboratively with the city to form those partnerships needed to develop the lands as they're critical to move forward on the original vision of Ice District and the downtown arena as a magnet for further development and, and quite frankly, a magnet for people. I will state unequivocally, we're committed to realizing the full vision for Ice District. Um, proud of what we've accomplished to date, having developed 16 of the 25 acres in the Ice District Master Planner and are excited about the opportunities uh, that the Central McDougal Queen Mary uh, Park area uh, provides for con continued development. Uh, next slide, please. And although we understand temporary parking is certainly not the highest and best use, these lots do provide an important interim solution to parking needs in the area. Um, we have followed all city processes to date to ensure these lots are regulated, while at the same time investing in the spaces to make them more appealing. Um, and it's important to note our application proposes temporary use on two of the four hectares in the lands north of the arena. And I'll also point out that the, uh, the east lot on the east side of the development uh, is paved. The temporary parking lots fill a significant need in the downtown core, certainly used by families and children, accessing programs in the downtown community arena. And we've seen it firsthand that it's helped reestablish patterns of people coming back into our downtown core, uh, casino patrons, event goers, people enjoying you know, the amazing uh, restaurants and hospitality in the core, retail customers and people going to work. Um, next slide. And we have developed, um, I showed this last time and it's a striking visual uh, illustration of the trans transformation we've been a part of in the downtown core. It's an aerial shot of Ice District before and after phase one development. And we've had really a generation of development um, in a scant decade. Next slide. And a little more detail for members of council. This slide illustrates the scale and timeline of development we've undertaken since 2013, when we signed the master agreement with the city. A considerable amount of development in a short period of time. We've opened not only the arena, but two office towers, Edmonton Tower, Stan Tech Tower, a new hotel in the JW Marriott residential units and legends and skies, 
and numerous other amenities, amenities such as the plaza, fan park, ice house, law blast, to name a few. Uh, next slide. And there's certainly been significant uh, both economic and community benefit uh, from that development as illustrated on this slide. Um, next slide. The revitalization and development has been centered on four important pillars, the economy, adding investment and development in our core, understanding that additional housing is needed in order to meet the, uh, the growing demand of people coming to our community, adding vibrancy in the downtown core for those people who want to live, work and play. And of course, connection to the very important uh, elements in the, in, of the city's uh, climate priorities. Next slide, and I'm out of time. Great, thank you. Sorry. So thank you. So any questions to those speakers who are in favor? Councillor Stevenson, I can go to you first. Thank you very much. Thanks for the, the presentation. You know, I think, um, you know, sharing the vision of the urban village is is great, and I think it's you know it's it's a vision that uh, we as a council supported at, at the rezoning stage. I think I'm just wondering how how you would answer folks who who feel that continuing to allow the temporary use is slowing down the development timelines for that project. Is that something you could speak to in terms of um, how that how the revenue from the parking lots factors into your development decisions? Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. And uh, yeah, as you had indicated, the rezoning was approved in August of 2022. Development does take time in terms of the next steps. And so with the approval of the zoning, we are going through additional work in terms of the infrastructure upgrades for servicing that are required, the studies, and those uh, studies and drawings do also need to get approved by the city again before kind of the next steps of development can occur. So it is a like the time frame in terms of when development can happen as well. It's a large area at over four hectares of land, so it will take time to develop. And just does does removing the temporary parking use accelerate that that redevelopment in any way? No, it does not. It's still based on kind of market and all the work that needs to be done. Okay, appreciate that. Um, and then recognizing that it is a large site, I assume that it's going to be rolled out in phases. So do we have confirmation that these areas would be part of the first phase of, of redevelopment? The confirmation comes from uh, understanding um, how do we get this land shovel ready for development because it's not at the present time it, no development can take place uh, it needs important infrastructure servicing um, once we have that certainty that this will take place then we can move to the next stage of development ideally we have already identified that we would like to start with the northern part of the lots that that is the one the lots that are bordering with 106 avenue um so the answer is yes we know more or less where we want to start but it all depends from when we can start servicing the land the, the land okay and so um i i recognize that this extension is for five years i believe so so what's your level of certainty in terms of all of those development pieces coming together in the next five years? Well, I would say that it needs to happen. We want it to happen. We are investing hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that we have already invested uh, to get to rezoning in 22. Uh, we are investing, probably we're going to invest over half a million dollars to get to servicing drawing um, to get this area serviced. So uh, the answer is I'm pretty certain uh, because I'm sure that everybody, including council, wants to see this uh, area being developed. Um, as I said in the previous meeting, um, we are very close to put in a, an application for CRL because the funding required uh, to service this area, it's important. 
Uh, we know how much that is. Um, so it will be the technical clients to get through this uh, CRL application, which you know better than me, it has to uh, can go through you. Uh, it's uh, it has to be uh, you have to ana analyze if it requires more funding. It needs an extension to the CRL, uh, and it needs to go back to the provincial government. I don't foresee this happening within the next twelve months. Probably not within next year because you have a city council election. But ideally, you want you know. If, we would love to see this happening and getting into a provincial budget uh, for the 26th uh, calendar year. In that case, we have approximately two years of servicing that will take place. So uh, reasonably, you know, we can look at completing servicing not earlier than 28. Okay, and the question is just around, you know, whether it makes sense um, to see see further upgrades, for example, hard to hard surfacing, recognizing that again, five years, you know, it's 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 a reasonable timeline, but it may may be missed. I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question. Uh, that's okay. I'm out of time, but it might be something I follow up with uh, with administration. Thank you very much, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, well, maybe I'll just I'll build on that um, because I, I'm concerned as well that this is going to sit vacant gravel lot um, for another five years with nothing being done. Um, and I know that according to administration's report um, that it meets with most of the requirements of the zoning, except for not being hard service, hard surface, not being landscaped no pathways for people. Um, my concern is with accessibility. You, you talk about the, um, the casino access. Um, I know a lot of seniors uh, attend casinos and they might have walkers or wheelchairs. And I'm just wondering how you would help to accommodate um, those people. Um, thank, thank you very much, Councillor Wright. Uh, it was a good question that was raised uh, when we were in front of council previously. And we had certainly talked to uh, uh, businesses, tenants, and others operating in and around the East District. And as it relates to accessibility, um, within Rogers Place, there's uh, three, some 300 stalls, uh, numerous uh, designated as accessible party, uh, parking with full access to um, elevators, full access to, to amenities like the casino, the downtown community arena, to, to public transportation. And so the accessibility needs are certainly uh, filled uh, uh, within the arena um, as we indicated so, that the what's what's the cost of that in relation to the outdoor parking the rates you know what councillor i'm not sure but i could like, certainly track that down for you yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it would probably be more so i'm but i don't know the, the report also talks about there's you know there's sufficient parking already in the area i i just don't I don't see this as being good use of land um, to have these surface parking lots in, especially in in uh, a gravel um, surface as well, um, as being you know aesthetically pleasing to the area. I I'm just also wondering the rezoning um, that was done August 22. What was the zoning prior? Uh, there was a DC one that was existing for the area as part of the Central McDougal ARP, and then we brought in the Central McDougal Urban Village Zone with the rezoning. Okay, so the DC one though also provided um, ability for um, residential building as well. Uh, yes, it did. Okay, so there. Okay, so things haven't been delayed because we didn't have the proper zoning in place. How long did we have that zoning in place? Oh. Not too sure as to the year when the DC one came in place. I believe it may have come in with the ARP process. Uh, administration might be able to tell you that piece. I, I'm just wondering, was it? Yeah, was it done like around the time that Rogers opened in 2016? Uh, oh no, that was existing zoning prior to Rogers Place. Okay, so it seems like forever that it's been zoned for. For residential? 
Yeah, sorry, I don't know the exact year, but it has been zoned for residential for quite some time. Okay, so the zoning hasn't been a problem to to get things built there. And, and Mr. Shipton, you'd mentioned about um, you've put in housing for 4,000 residents. I thought I noticed on one of your slides. Uh, that's that slide combines both housing and uh, employees within the, the overall ACE district. So it's 2,500 units plus uh, an additional 1,500 employees. So 2,500 units in the Marriott or I, I'm, I'm just not sure where the residential. It, the residential piece is what we're talking about uh, with the proposed phase two development. So that 4,000 is not current residents as a result of. No, it's not current know. resident. The, the number is uh, a shade over 800 right now, Councillor, in phase one. And that's okay. one of the things that we wanted to include for you in, in the in the graphics was just the, the development that we have done to date. Um, acquiring that land certainly never envisioned it uh, to be parking for, for, for the rest of time. We need to develop that land. We've made a commitment. We've developed, as I said, 16 of 25 acres over the last 10 years. So it's not like we're sitting on our hands. We're, we're doing this in an orderly process. The market is lining up for us to develop. We just need, you know, we're asking for that time to do it okay, properly. My, my time is up, but I do want to come back to that point about your vision and lining up with the market. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you to uh, speakers who have attended today. Um, just to to follow up on some of the questions, I guess um, you got you put in the zoning application. You were approved at that time. Uh, you know, it's been about two years now, and now we're hearing that there's uh, a challenge with, uh, I'm assuming, utility uh, service connections or something like that. Is that am I hearing that correctly? Thank you, Councillor Buquette. There's just servicing upgrades that are required to support the development, and that typically comes in after zoning is approved. Yeah, for sure. And so when did that begin, that process? Is it beginning now, or did it begin two years ago? Uh, it started after the zoning was approved, but there is still further work happening at this moment. Okay, so I'm curious about that. Two years to, to rectify and then additional five years on top of that seems kind of it's stretching a little bit of the uh, belief, I suppose. Um, not really. Uh, when you think that, you know, um, well, not we, for have you. Gone through, we, we have gone through uh, two COVID years um, and we started diligently working in putting together uh, a study of servicing probable costs uh, right at the end of 22. That took us well into first quarter, second quarter of 23. After that, we started to do a, a density uh, allocation of the nine acres um, in order to come up with the proper uh, servicing plan. Um, we have then developed uh, we started working, and when, when I say we, we're commissioning these consultants. Uh, we started working um, with respect to the phasing of the development, um, and then start doing some uh, conceptual uh, yeah. plan for the development. So it's I'm a lot of work that yeah. has taken place over the last two years. Yeah, and and yeah, I guess every organization is going to do it differently on different timelines. So um, I guess the next question then would be um, sort of waiting for market, market favorability. I'm just wondering if you can expand on that a little bit uh, because we will have, uh, you know, something to consider tomorrow about, um, uh, you know, office conversion into residential. It's going to chew up a bunch of CRL if that gets approved. We've got uh, wind spear that's going to chew up a bunch if that gets approved. And uh, so I'm just wondering about timelines, about market demand. Is that sort of what's driving this? Is that right now there just doesn't seem to be the market favorability, but you anticipate it with population growth and property uh, 
increasing like that's sort of what's driving some of this like i'm unclear about what is specifically driving this request well it's everything you've said councillor um it's definitely we're looking at yeah the population growth uh we're looking at um that is going to happen over the next you know so many years um we're looking at the student housing demand that is we know that all the universities are under pressure, and uh, and we had Graham McEwen, uh, Northwest, Nate, U of A, all accessible through the uh, public trans uh, transport, the LRT that is right next to the uh, to this area. Uh, in fact, you know we're even uh, looking at transforming this uh, 2,500 into some sort of uh, uh, more majority of it into a student village um, catering uh, to these uh, to, to these uh, universities. But there's certainly room for multifamily. There is room for uh, uh, elderly and retirement uh, type of housing. Uh, yeah. The location the location is perfect, you know, for uh, connecting that area with the downtown uh, uh, the downtown area. Okay, so essentially what I'm hearing is. Uh... Maybe a little bit of, um, we know the market's going to grow, which will lead to favorable uh, pricing. And uh, we know that uh, maybe inflation is start, starting to even out, maybe come down. So really, it's an economic sort of consideration that you have to take in mind to uh, to start putting shovels on the ground, along with the servicing that has uh, taken an extraordinary amount of time. I think I got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Um... Would you like to move a second round? Would someone like to move a second round? So happy to move a second round. Second. Great. Uh, please vote on a second round. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Just missing one, Councillor Cartmel. We will mark Councillor Cartmel absent. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Please go ahead, Councillor Wright. Thank you. So I guess um, maybe maybe you started to answer a bit of my my question there as far as you know, maybe changing that initial vision that you had um, for future development. You're in the you're in the planning stages now for that. Are like, could we expect something new in the next year? Uh, um, I don't know what you mean by something new, but yes, we are in the in the advanced stage uh, of getting to technical drawing that mean that means the final drawing for service in the area um because that's where our focus is right now um we and that's an important job uh that's going to take about six months i don't know how many engineers and probably half a million dollars worth of investment so that's that is what you're going to be seeing not next year but Certainly, for the next, the end of the next six months, uh, we'll be able to share this with the city administration. Because I'm really hesitant to, you know, uh, approve extension of this for another five years without it seeing any substantial progress, I guess, being made on your part. Um, you know, so if if you know maybe after a year we saw you know there was some actual substantial um change in, in that vision um you know then maybe could be considered for a longer term i'm also got some questions in regards to that um the section of land um showing in the report um the cmuv zone no temporary parking uh, i think i asked last time is that being included in this um in this rezoning request and i i think i was told no well the park itself yeah the park is 
not included as part of the parking area. No, no, sorry. The sections between, what is it, 103rd and 104th Street? So if you look on page six of seven of attachment two, the planning report. Yeah, the lands between 103rd Street and 104th Street, south of 106th Avenue, are not within the lands we're asking for temporary parking on. Okay, so then I don't know, maybe if I should ask you or administration why that land is showing in the actual bylaw 20728 under section 7.5.12. There to is one, development. What? Yeah, sorry, there is one parking lot between 103 and 104th Street, which it services the emergency services building, which is the city building on 105th Street. Um, that is a parking lot that exists there, but it's not within our application. Okay, I'll, I'll ask admin then why it is included here in the, in the bylaw. Okay. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, Councillor Knack is gone. Um, who, <laughs> who would take the chair after Councillor Knack? Oh, oh, he's back. Councillor Knack, do you take the chair? Thank for you, a sorry, I just didn't want to cough. All over. <laughs> thank you. Go, uh, got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah. So just, just a question um, about, and 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 I ask this because I'm just trying to seek some greater context here. Uh, the fan park. So uh, obviously that's not exactly what we're talking about today, but with the history of the fan park, when the back rat was demolished, um, the intention there was for it to be a surface parking lot, a temporary surface parking lot. And to my understanding, that was denied at the time. And now we, now we have the fan park um, where there's sort of ongoing activations. First of all, is that correct? Um, I just want to make sure my recollection is is correct, and just I guess your thoughts on how that might relate to today's conversation. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that that is correct. Um, that fan park, I think, as you know, sat um, fairly dormant post a demolition of the old, back, old Baccarat casino site. And so, you know, again, as we were lining up um, development vibrancy opportunities, um, we looked to the fan park to say we could get some some programming and bring some people into the downtown core. So uh, paved that, that land, I think, as you know, we paved it, uh, fenced it, and have um, used it as a, you know, as a, I would say, a flexible outdoor space hosting I mean, everything from concerts to, you know, significant community program. We've got a longstanding partnership with Free Play for Kids. They've used that site um, extensively uh, for their children's programming, hockey Edmonton, ball hockey Edmonton, youth basketball. So it has been a, quite an active space uh, since paving. And is the, is the intention for the fan park to eventually be redeveloped? Um, I would say it's too early to tell right now. I think the fan park is filling a, a very important need uh, in the downtown core, bringing vibrancy. I think we're, I think we've actually surpassed the hundred thousand guest mark of uh, people coming into the fan park. So I think we're weighing options uh, for that space. Um, it's been a surprise as to how many people have. Uh, come down and, and enjoyed the uh, the programming. So I would say we're we're sort of assessing uh, options on that space right now. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, I'll uh, save the rest of my questions. Thanks, and I'll take the chair back. I'll return to the chair. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm not seeing any further questions on the board for our speakers in favor. Um, so we can now go to. Those folks who are in opposition. Uh, so I'm just going to double check that our speakers are here. Uh, I have Michael Brown from the Central McDougall Community League and Victoria Manor Condo Corporation. Are you with us, Michael? 
not hearing from Michael, uh, Warren Champion from the Central McDougal Community League. Are you online? Uh, yes, I'm online. Excellent. Uh, so Warren, we'll go to you first. Uh, you have five minutes and then we'll check in with Michael after that. Please go ahead. So my presentation is really divided into two parts, but I want to give you an overview of certain things. Uh, at the last March uh, public hearing, you, you asked how many units uh, were up, how many parking units would be available, and people looked a bit puzzled, and then uh, Stanpec said there were 230 units. Well, there's actually over 700 units, and we've been down and we've counted them in, in three different events, and trust me, there's over 700 units. Uh, the cost was also described as being $14 an hour or for, for the, the night, I guess. Actually, the cost on the parking box is $23 per special event. There's two special events, basically hockey and all the other special events. Uh, and I just wanted to say something about the utility work. Not all utility work has to be done completely before you can do anything on that site. There's certain major either uh, thoroughfares, streets or alleys that you have to deal with. But at the end of the day, there's been large sites developed where not all of the underground utilities have been done completely because sometimes there are changes. And it's very interesting in 2016, December 2016, uh, the Oilers asked for 10 years. They were given three years. Uh, and in that discussion, which is on the tape, you'll find them saying, well, they probably won't be back in the first year, but they're looking at developing a building in the second year. So that's a long time ago. And I'm saying, if they gave that answer, then maybe you don't need three or four years or five years to do utility work or anything else. And, you know, uh, the pr prior zoning going way back when, well, 2016, there was a, a tree treatment, which is included in uh, 2728, uh, 20728, and that, those trees have never been installed around that site. It's kind of su a surprise to us. Uh, we tried to come up with how much revenue is actually generated by the uh, surface parking lots. And it's not really that easy to do because we don't know what special deals are sitting there. But we kind of figured there's more or less at least at the low end, two million bucks. We've asked both the city and the Oilers for two and a half percent of that as a community amenity doesn't appear that either party is that concerned by that. So, I mean, that could be seen to be almost a shocking situation where the community that is most highly affected by all of the traffic gets absolutely nothing out of it. And we assured council and the Oilers, that it would all be going into a specific amenity in the community. And that didn't seem to uh, draw a positive response. And about two and a half months ago, we talked to Stantec, told them that we would like to participate from an amenity perspective and they said they would get back to us. That never happened. So we had a recent meeting and that really, we weren't very enthusiastic about that meeting either. So at the end of the day, we just wonder, I mean, you know, you are putting a humongous number of cars in our community and they're absolutely doing nothing for the community and we can't seem to extract two and a half percent as a, I guess, shared revenue source. So 
we find that to be really, really surprising. Uh, you know, I know uh, I have a really good history on this whole issue, and I'm not going to go much further except to say this is just not the correct way to go. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'll now just check in to see if Michael Brown is online. Michael told me that he was going to be back. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't see him online at this time. Um, so I will go to questions of speakers, uh, starting with Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you so much for being with us uh, here today. Uh, you know, appreciate the comments that you've you've flagged and some of the concerns of the impact of of this parking on the community. You know, one <clears throat> aspect that I'm really struggling with is that, you know, recognizing that development is is sort of moving through on on a timeline that that uh, relates to servicing um, and and other considerations to sort of start development. What's what is your thoughts? Recognizing you can't speak for the whole community, but your your thoughts on, you know, the impact of those properties just being sort of entirely vacant, um, being just sort of fenced up, uh, versus having having that interim car parking use. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. I think there's been chaos in Central McDougal, which has gone a long way to preventing anybody from building anything because nobody was gonna buy anything. I think a lot of that chaos has been removed. And I also believe that every other parking lot in that area is illegal. Somebody just knocked the building down and have put parking on a fair sized site. So my suggestion would be, because we've discussed this since the last public hearing, we are willing to support three years and we think that basically council should just give everybody three years to start developing it, or even to put some trees around it, which is not gonna be all that expensive and is gonna look better than a plethora of cars. And after three years, that should be it. That we won't support it, and I don't think it's necessary. I guess the only party that we might support is if all the other parking lots were closed down, we might come back and say, you know, we'll look at supporting something from the Oilers parking lots because they're right close to the uh, amenity space. And if it's just one illegal parking space, it makes more sense. But having said that, a long time ago, we all came to the conclusion and I came to this conclusion that surface parking absolutely kills the community and it becomes the cash flow with very little maintenance becomes addictive. And I'd hate to see exactly the same thing that happened in downtown with all the gravel parking lots happen in this area. It's just criminal and it's not what the North Edge eventually or at some point in time ever, ever, uh, ever imagined. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were attempting to create a Vancouver light and that's, the whole process that I brought to the city and surface parking was not part of that concept. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I also appreciate your desire to see some sort of revenue sharing or amenity contribution. You know, something that, that I reflect on is that, um, you know, by providing a path to, to compliance, to having permits means that they would have a business license in place, which, would allow them to contribute to the North Edge uh, Business Improvement Area and, and uh, the Chinatown BIA as well. So, uh, you know, just wondering your thoughts there that uh, that is a form of, of revenue that would come to be invested in, in the area by, by supporting this rezoning. Well, I guess that probably would be considered I'm saying we have very specifically laid out what we would do with 50,000 bucks a year. What we could do is there's two city properties that is a community garden. That money would go there and be used. And we have a ton of people who would actually really like to use and be community gardeners. And they are scared because it's become a meth hangout 
uh, our building, our shed has been burnt to the ground. Every time I go over there, I find people who don't belong there. So we'd like to do something for the community, and it's right next to the LRT. Mm -hmm. But something, something is better than nothing. However, however it gets characterized, as it sits right now, I'm not trying to be casual about this, but we really feel that the community is getting screwed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll continue to, to sort of consider the points that you've raised. Thank you. Thanks so much. Councillor Jans, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of continue on um, the line of thought, Mr. Champion, you were saying about um, this being addictive. Um, and I'm looking at a story from 2016 where then Councillor Ben Henderson said, I'm just terrified that once we go down this road, we're going to end up exactly where we don't want to be. We're going to end up stuck in a sea of parking lots. And I guess, you know, I was thinking about what you said, um, how if, 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 if a three-year extension was granted, would that not yet again continue to provide kind of a uh, in economic terms, a perverse incentive towards delaying further development because, you know, millions of dollars of profit could be generated with without expense? Well, uh, Ben was a really smart guy. I always appreciated his observations and it was dead on. I'm just trying to find something that works for both sides. I mean, if you gave these people three years, we would never support anything beyond that ever, 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 ever. I mean, what we what we would support may or may not mean. But what's anybody. different? What's different now, Warren, than in twenty yeah, no, sixteen? No, like, what's different now? Like they, if they've already had the the lot for for years. Um, well, I. I I'm trying to be somewhat diplomatic, and you'll have to pardon me. I have a flu. Uh, I mean, Central McDougal has the highest poverty in Edmonton and the second highest crime rate, just marginally behind Macaulay. And the chaos was so overwhelming that I can understand why nobody would buy, and I can understand why the Oilers wouldn't be building anything. That chaos, I think, is being removed to a substantial degree, and once that chaos is gone, then our reluctant support is going to disappear very quickly. And so that's why I'm kind of saying, in the past, I just don't think anybody was ever going to build there. I think they can now build there, and that's changed our perception on it. We were reluctant supporters all the way along on this. Now we are got a, a basically a timeline on it. And we spent in the last month talking to a bunch of people in the community, and they just hate surface parking lots. They hate all the disorder that it brings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they do understand that these people now have the ability to actually build something, not just them, but all the other illegal uh, parking lots. And I'm just saying, I think you guys, after three years, should shut them all down and uh, if you put a few trees around something, it's not going to cost you very much. Uh, and how, how about just one year? Would one year satisfy your desire to see progress? Well, I am sympathetic to these guys because I realize that they have some... They require some time. I'm not, I, you know, I'm not trying to... I mean, I think it's a good plan. And by the way, that plan is basically an extension of what an architect and I did back in 203. And I, I'm, I just don't think they can probably do what they need to do in a year. I, I am saying that I'm just kind of thinking maybe all of us have to say three years, that's it, bingo, and for every illegal parking lot in the whole area close it down, and if they want to sit with a fence uh, around it, our view is that it's better than looking at a plethora of cars. Uh, I think a year is probably a bit too short. Uh, I was initially saying two years would work. I talked to a bunch of people in the community, and we all agreed probably three years, but that would be it, absolutely it. 
So, I mean, you guys are going to do what you're going to do. Uh, we're just trying to be practical and realistic here. And we like the plan. We just don't like being left out of the plan. Yeah, and that's referring to the the league not receiving any of the community amenity contributions, the no. financial support. Yeah, last week we had a meeting with the Oilers, and it was a relatively pleasant meeting, but it, it did nothing. All we thought was, oh, here's a chance we can do this and do that, and I'd be saying exactly the same things today, just thanking the Oilers for their support. And like they gave us a half an hour. Well, thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Champion, I'm just wondering if if we did three years, um, who's to say that in three years, the, the, the council at that time would then put a stop to it. Um, I'm just wondering if we do it at a, a year at a time, there's sort of more um, more ability to, I guess, monitor sort of what action has been completed in that year's time. Well, I, I, I realize that you can't speak for future councils, but I do think that as part of the minutes of this meeting, however you want to characterize it, that you can very strongly say, Three years, that's it. That's it for illegal parking lots in this whole area. And please, future councils, will you acknowledge and honor our commitment? That's all you can do. But I am saying three years from now, we won't be back here supporting anything ever, period. Nil. Yeah. Right, but I, 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 I understand what you're saying, Councilor Wright. Okay. And in, in that half hour discussion that you had um, with Oilers Entertainment Group, um, was there anything as far as, you know, that community garden space or beautification of the area at all to? Yes, there was. Uh, and they also chastised us for not communicating with them. I, I, I mean, I, I could have got involved in it, but we tried to communicate two and a half months ago with them and they never got back to us. You know, what, what can I say? We will meet on a dime with anybody if it will help the darn community. That's, that's, that's why we're here doing and spending a bunch of time doing these things. And that's why I, uh, yeah, they, they know what we want to do. And and so and like I said, that community garden and sort of that kind of rejuvenate the, or that kind of activity would help to rejuvenate the spot for the area oh, right now. Oh yes, let me tell you, there's two lots, city owned, right by the LRT there. So you can look at it and you think, my gosh, that's disgusting. Or we have put in place and we price almost the whole darn thing out, where we can create a truly, truly nice community garden, a secured community garden. And, you know, I talked to gardeners in the, mostly in the past because they won't be gardeners again, but they're scared, absolutely scared of the people that are in there all the time. And something bad is going to happen. So we may simply not do that community garden in the, in the future unless we can actually do something to ensure that these people are safe doing it. Okay, so by secured, you would mean like fenced in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and what was the cost that you had worked out? We figured that what we would do is we have about 25,000 more or less, a little bit more. And if we could get even a couple of years at 50,000 bucks a year, that would be 100,000. So that'd be 125,000. We could go to CFEB and get a matching grant for another 125, which conforms to their uh, small, the auspices under a small grant up to 250. And we figure for that amount, we can do everything that we wanna do, maybe not create a very cool water supply. That may be the last thing that we might need of a few more dollars to do it. That's the only thing that we haven't priced out. But so we've got the prices and all these things and we were able to negotiate a pretty reasonable price actually. But the, the provincial CFAB funding is is drying up as well, I guess. Yeah, it's it is. A bit of a drought too. 
Okay. Um, okay, I think that's all of the questions I have. Thank you very much uh, for coming again to speak. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thanks, Councillor Wright. Um, so I'm not seeing anyone else on the board for questions of those who are speaking in opposition. Uh, so we can now go to questions of administration. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. I, I think I think what we're talking about is, is a lot of trade-offs and just trying to balance sort of what what um, the best way forward is. Just wondering if you have some thoughts or reflections on, um, I believe right now it's a five-year temporary allowance. Uh, we've heard a call from the community for a three-year. Just what are, what are some thoughts um, from your perspective on that? Thanks, Councillor. I think uh, as per our recommendation, we think the five years, or I guess it's not quite five years anymore, but um, 2028 uh, is appropriate. Um, understanding that we are getting some additional contributions um, through this application in terms of the perimeter landscaping, uh, proper pathways through the site, that kind of stuff. Um, so we do think that that's an appropriate um, amount of time uh, given the upgrades. Uh, it's a challenging thing. I know there's a lot of discussion about the hard surfacing. Um, we would not recommend hard surfacing, I don't think, for, uh, for this period of time. Uh, it just leads the site to seem more permanent. And um, five years can go by pretty quickly in a, lot, in a development timeline. So I think we've got the correct numbers with this application. Thank you for that. Um, just want to also confirm that um, these two sites fall respectively within the North Edge and Chinatown BIAs, um, and that there would be a, a BIA levy contribution with the correct permits in place? It does fall within the North Edge BIA, um, and following the conversations around the parking lots of the downtown one, uh, the business license would follow the permit. Okay, great. Um, and that would that would be a requirement. Um, do we, yeah, we don't often require business licenses at the development permit stage, but it's a requirement for operations. Um, it wouldn't we wouldn't look to regulate any of that within the DC in terms of um, how fees flow or or the portions of such. Okay. Do we have? Um, and I'm not sure if we can share. And this, I think, is going to be a conversation for council tomorrow. But but I did hear a reference. I'm just thinking about the land use, the long-term land use viability of the zoning that's in place, um, and her discussion of the public infrastructure investment that's required. Do we have a sense of the order of magnitude that's being requested, or again, is that maybe not appropriate? We're st it's, it's still the initial part of the application in terms of, of shepherding that through. So uh, no no numbers yet to share on that. Okay, and just to inform the timelines. Is this something that would be a new catalyst project or does it fall within existing CRL provisions for, for public infrastructure? It would likely be a new project that, that would have to go through that process of approval with the province. Okay, so just again, thinking back to timelines, um, that's usually, a, that would be a more involved process? I think when we amended the CRL the last time, it was nine to 12 months for okay. the last project that was added. Okay. Great. Um, I think those are all the questions I have now. I may come back, but, uh, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Salvador. Thank you for the information. Just a few uh, remaining questions. Appreciate you sort of flagged that you think five years is reasonable. I, you know, I'm also hearing from the community they feel three years is reasonable and it's not an exact science. You're trying to figure out the best piece. What happens, so if we went three years uh, and they decided they still needed an extra two years because they're not where they need to be, what kind of, uh, I'm gonna look at Mr. Johnson as I ask this question because I'm just curious what the, the cost is for them to reapply because I'm worried about the, you know, there's, a, there's gonna be a question of burden of, of additional cost and impact. Is that a fair question, Mr. Johnson, as I look at you? Some We're pushing in the gray area, but I don't think I have a problem with administration providing to you what the implications are of rezoning okay. again. Yeah, that's really the question I think I have, yes. Yeah, so if we, uh, and just to clarify, we, this is a text amendment application, I hear it. exactly. Right? So, that's um, uh, yeah, but it, they would have to do another application to amend the text again, change the year. Um, 
in terms of the process, it would be like any uh, re rezoning or tax amendment application. There'd be public engagement uh, yeah. that would be done. Uh, they'd pay application fees. We'd process it uh, and and bring that back to this council. isn't a d d c it's not a though, control. which is a very oftentimes a far more costly endeavor in, in in terms of process and potentially even dollar amount versus a standard zone. Is that correct? Text amendments are still relatively pricey um, okay. relative to just a rezoning between two standard zones. Okay. Um, if we're looking at our 2024 fee schedule, a uh, text amendment like this might cost them between ten and fifteen thousand okay. um, dollars. That could change in future mm -hmm. years, of course, yeah. but that's just using okay. today's that's helpful. Numbers. That's helpful for me. Um, and I guess just the other question, and I think Councillor Stevenson is sort of asking about this. I'm, I'm thinking about the report that was discussed at Urban Planning Committee and sort of the, the gen appreciate council hasn't approved the direction, but committee has approved a recommendation. Let's assume that is approved by council. How does what is likely to, what could be approved by council tomorrow align or not align with this idea? So the idea from what, how I understand what committee approved is that there, there would be a, a pathway to uh, temporary legalization of, of lots um, for X amount of time. There would be certain requirements. They'd have to have a business license. So does this follow essentially a lot of what you would envision you would be creating as part of a, a citywide plan? The improvements uh, sought through this application are similar to what we're thinking uh, with that report and that will be discussed fully at council tomorrow. Um, and at committee previously uh, around the perimeter planting, the pathways um, and the lighting. Uh, just in terms of the, the steps, it's a little bit different uh, just because right now we're, what's in front of you is the outright permission of the use. Yeah. Um, so it's a little different in that respect, uh, but similar in terms of time frame as well. Is there, yeah, and so I guess my only other question is, is there anything that is out of, you know, again, appreciate you haven't created exactly what that program would look like, but you identified some high level pieces. Is there anything that that you would envision asking of other surface parking lots that we're not asking for here? No, uh, what we're looking at there is uh, based, based off of this uh, and other uh, similar applications. So uh, there wouldn't be an over and above uh, okay. what's being required. That's what I was curious. Or, or, or lesser than, than others either. So they're, they're not necessarily going over and above, but they're not necessarily going below what you might expect of others. Correct, but just keep in mind that uh, any of those uh, regulations or that program hasn't come forth in front of council yet, which we'll have that debate. Understandable. Happens. Just, uh, yeah, I wanted to have a general sense of, you know, are we treating them relatively equally to what we think we would be treating other ones at? So, and, that, and what I'm hearing is the answer is yes. Okay. All right, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Knack. Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so I was concerned that if we haven't uh, approved at council um, these, you know, these changes for everyone else, um, and if, if changes or amendments are made tomorrow, this um, this bylaw will not be affected by it, correct? Uh, Councillor, there wouldn't be any changes made tomorrow. Um, so if, if the direction is given to administration to uh, pursue a program for the broader center city, um, we would be looking to make further text amendments to the zoning bylaw more broadly, um, and that would come uh, at a later date. But the initial thinking is that those changes that would come for the broader area align with what this application is uh, proposing to do, but that hasn't come to fruition yet. Okay. And so, and then in the um, bylaw, I mean, it, it does talk about the pathways and the lighting and all that, and that is, that's required like now, right? Once, if this gets approved. If, if this were to get approved, uh, they would have to add uh, pathways through the site, um, as well as some more landscaping around the perimeter. Some of the other features for parking lots um, that are already requirements are already existing, such as the lighting um, situation is there, and then the, the hard surfacing would, would not be uh, necessary going forward. Well, it wouldn't be approved going forward. Okay. Um, and then the, is there any way to put a restriction on that says this is the the last and final um, time that it will um, that it would be considered as a temporary parking lot? Uh, this is uh, Jamie Johnson here. No, Council, there isn't. C council has to come to any public hearing with an applicant with an open mind. And so 
an applicant on any any parcel of land in the city has a right to bring a proposal to you. Council, of course, has the right to refuse or accept those as they come. Okay, okay. So, but um, like Mr. Champion was saying, he wanted sort of something that would that could be this is the final time, but we can't do that. Okay, um, and then I guess. For the bylaw itself, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, um, the minimum 40 vehicle parking lot. So that's between the 103rd and 104th Street. That's owned by the applicant or is that owned by the city? Uh, Councillor, that's actually the city's lot and that's for the emergency response uh, center. So that, that's kind of gotten its own exception to all the rules uh, going through this process to ensure that um, that facility has parking but it, it would only be, be used by that facility. It's not public parking. Okay, I, I'm just wondering why, it, why it's showing up in this, in this bylaw amendment. So the reason is because this is a text amendment bylaw, so it's not a rezoning that's actually site specific. Um, so we've shown the entire area that the CU, CMUV zone applies. Um, however, the conversation about temporary surface parking is just the site uh, to the east of 103rd Street. So that's just, it's just shown for a visual reference. Okay, and is that hard surfaced? The, the city lot has a requirement yeah. to be hard surfaced, yes, and enclosed, it's, it's secured access and everything. Okay, so if the city was able to do hard surface, I just don't understand why the proponent can't. Well, again, that's a, that's a dedicated parking lot for a city facility that's been there for a very long time. Long, longer than the other surface parking lots that we're talking about here today? I, I can't say for certain, but the, the emergency management center has been in that building for um, many years and the parking lot is there to serve them. So it predates the application of the initial application going back at least to 2017, 2016. Uh, it's, it's sort of considered separate from the whole uh, urban village development that's being brought by this landowner. Okay, thank you for answering my questions. Thanks, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Nack, could you take the chair, please? I've got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just want to get some clarity around the current, the current temporary use. Um, so what requirements were in place when that temporary use was, was put forward uh, related to things like lighting, landscaping, pathways, etc.? So the, the DC1 zoning going back to 2016 when the temporary surface parking lots were uh, first formally allowed um, required them to do perimeter planting, um, which was done. Uh, you'll notice some fairly new trees around the perimeter of the site. Uh, they also had to hard surface the entry points to the parking lots, and that has also been done. They had to provide uh, lighting and some wayfinding, and those are also things that have been done and have existed since then. Okay, so is there anything that I guess hasn't been done that was a requirement of that? No, they, they applied for permits after that rezoning and have developed in accordance with those permits. Okay, um, so I'm just trying, because I'm hearing similar requirements around, you know, perimeter planting hard, uh, or sorry, um, lighting pathways will be required with the new one. So the pathways would be new. So that they have no, don't currently have a requirement for pathways through the site. So that would be a new requirement to improve the accessibility, the functionality of the sites and, and getting to the parts of the parking lot that are quite a ways away from say Rogers Place. Uh, and then normally a parking lot would require landscaped islands, um, a permanent parking lot. And so what we've done with this application is sort of shifted those landscaping requirements that would normally be found in the, in the islands and put them on the perimeter. So it, there'd be a requirement to increase the amount of perimeter planting that was previously required. So there'd be more trees, some more shrubs and planting beds just to try and improve the aesthetics around the perimeter. Okay, um, what is the timeline for those types of uh, upgrades and requirements to be met if this were to move forward? So How long does the applicant have? If these amendments are changed, they would have to apply for a development permit uh, right away and those would be issued with that development permit and they'd have to develop it um, there's not a specific timeline other than when you get a development permit, you have to have your development meet it. And if not, then you could be subject to enforcement. Okay, and uh, as part of the 2016 um, uh, temporary permit that was issued, like again, were those upgrades made pretty quickly immediately or was there a lag time, do we know? My, my recollection is that they were developed um, in an 
a reasonable timeline. Depends on the seasons, obviously, with landscaping sure. and when things are approved. But essentially, that landscaping went in as soon as they had developed the temporary okay. parking lot. Okay, thanks for that context. Um, I'm also wondering, you know, administration is not recommending hard surfacing, and I, I understand that from the perspective that it makes the site more seem or seem more permanent. Um, I guess, what is a typical threshold in terms of timeline when we would start to recommend hard surfacing? I think that's a good question. I don't think we have a specific uh, timeline. I think that could be something that gets explored through the, the program that might get developed for the broader area to see what uh, amount, how many years are appropriate before we have to start thinking about hard surfacing. Um, so I don't have a specific answer for you. But typically, if you look at a development, even if they weren't going to be uh, seeking temporary parking. Developments of large sites can, can easily take five to ten years to go through the whole process. Um, so even when there's maybe more certainty that development's definitely going to happen, um, we probably wouldn't want to see hard surfacing for an interim period of less than five years. Right. And this is, this is what I'm struggling with because I'm like, 13 years <laughs> um, is potentially what we're looking at, right? And yeah, I think you're right. It, it makes me contemplate uh, how that might be integrated into the program so that uh, we're not this far along before we're having that conversation. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's you could look at it as 13 years, but I mean, there's a lot of change that has happened in that 13 sure. years. Um, sure. And obviously, this particular landowner had a lot of focus on phase one of the development in, in, the, in the first part of that time period. So, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that the phase one of ICE District is nearly fully complete, if not fully complete, and I do believe we'll see, start to see a focus from them probably on this phase two in, in the amount of time frame that they're seeking for this temporary parking. Okay, um, I'm gonna squeeze one more in. Um, Trade-offs of waiting until uh, the program that we're discussing tomorrow is in place versus moving forward today. I think just in terms there of what the discussion is tomorrow, uh, there's a high degree of certainty, I think, from uh, council and committee's perspective in, in terms of administration's uh, recommendation around that through the, the committee discussion uh, two weeks ago. Um, our stance hasn't changed or won't change uh, on that one. Um, I think in general, uh, as mentioned uh, during the conversations with Councillor Mack, is that uh, we expect the, the provisions to be uh, quite similar uh, in terms of time frame and the, the requirements uh, that would be required uh, in terms of allowing some some of those temporary uses. Uh, go from there. And I'll monitor my own time, uh, but I'll uh, take the chair back and go oh, to Councillor Jans. I'll return the chair. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify with administration the timeline. So if um, uh, the applicant decided to break ground tomorrow and get going on this project. Um, where where are they at in the process? Uh, and you're talking about the parking lot or for the overall development? Yeah, any any development on that parking lot. Like we heard about utility work that needs to be done. Like is the city in any way holding up that utility work? Councillor Jans, um, we are starting initiative or have started conversations about infrastructure and opportunities for using the CRL to support some infrastructure uh, development, and so those are early early days in that conversation. But we have started. So the ne next steps would be to figure out uh, infrastructure, servicing agreements, development agreements, uh, then development permits and building permits. And could that be done in a span of weeks, months, years? Years, like Here. yeah, it's a it, it's a it's a longer development process, but um, you know the the entire vision for the site is twenty five hundred units, so that's something that's going to take a number of years to to shepherd through. And um, some, but work could be happening concurrently, right? Like like yes. the utility issues they alluded to could be dug up and fixed now, right? And that's what we're working with OEG on right now is um, looking at their infrastructure plan, uh, looking at uh, the requirements, the standards, there's some uh, specialized cross sections within the development, uh, what's the staging and phasing of the development, so where's phase one, so working through that all right now uh, with the applicant. Right, um, so in other words, the as that, as that planning commences, um, they could be breaking ground on this parking lot in a much shorter time period than the lease allows for. 
like conceivably, even even if we extend the permission for the parking lot it, for a multi-year duration, if market conditions change, that they could they they or 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 whatever whatever is the barrier right now. Um, if if they had the utility work sorted out, um, they they could have shovels in the ground much sooner. Am I understanding that correctly? So there, we haven't quite established where phase one of the development program is. So it could be where the parking lot is, or it could be elsewhere on the on the site. It's a it's a large development site. Right. I guess. Yeah. Um, did the administration contemplate even a partial parking lot, like not this full, not this full area, but a smaller area to allow them to get going on the utility work or the the other digging that they need to do now? Councillor, I don't think that the parking lot existence should be considered a barrier to them doing development. If, if the conditions are lining up and the utility plan is in place, I, I don't think they would hesitate to um, shift from having land have cars parked on it to developing and or putting in utilities or whatever else. Um, and and why, why do you think that? Well, because they came and applied for zoning that has an overall vision for development. And if the market conditions are lining up for them to achieve that, and we've got some of the technical stuff lined up, I don't, I don't, don't see a reason why they wouldn't proceed with that just because they've got a temporary parking lot there. Yeah, I, I'm wary of some of the other sites in our city that are zoned, but uh, still sitting inactive. So um, I, I, I hold concern there. Um, I understand there was the con contemplation of... Uh, potentially reducing the duration. I, I mean, I suggested to one year and then they can come back in one year and we can, you know, evaluate progress and see if they want to extend it another year, we can evaluate it then. Um, uh, but just five years seems on top of all the other extensions that have already been granted, uh, it just seems too, too generous right now. Um, so I was wondering about administration's take on a, a reduced duration. Uh, well, I'll, Councillor, I mean, obviously, City Council can can choose to change that date if they see fit. I mean, when the initial application came in and was approved in 2022, the initial uh, ask was for 2025, um, and administration supported that. Uh, really, we just look at the application, the, the applications that come in, and whatever the whatever the existing uh, conditions and progress is at that time. Um, so, our recommendation recommendation today is that 2028. Is appropriate, but uh, council can certainly decide otherwise. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Jans. Would you like to move a second round? I'll move a second round. Second. Please vote on a second round. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Go ahead, Councillor Wright. Thanks very much. Ms. Petrin, you said that you're just, they're just starting with the, the process right now um, for, C, for the CRL. What, what if they, what if that process was to be, um, if they were to forego that, how much, time would that shorten the process? Uh, well, the, the the applicant would still need to go through development agreements and, and servicing agreements. So, um, you know, that, that could shorten the process if there wasn't a need to navigate through the CRL and adding it as a project to the CRL. Um, because so then that, that subsequently needs provincial approval. It does. Right? Yeah. Yes. And... Um, we don't we don't necessarily get things proved through the province. So that's my concern that there's going to be a further delay because of that. Um, and so how much with, without having to do that process, how much would that cut back the time? It's hard to estimate that because there's opportunities to look at the staging and phasing of how the site might develop uh, over time. Um, but, you know, to to look at our previous experience in navigating a new project in the CRL uh, with provincial approval took about between nine and 12 months. Okay, so up to a year. Okay, and so last time we approved, 
approve the rezoning on a one year term, which is something that's been sort of batted around here as well, just to kind of keep an eye on things. Um, but we've seen really no additional progress since since August of 2022. Is that right? But besides them now coming forward. Councillor, I think uh, in line with a lot of development projects downtown, uh, there hasn't been a, a lot of movement uh, in terms of new development permits uh, that, uh, that we have seen, uh, and that's largely due to the market conditions, uh, which is also another reason why we think five years is appropriate, that it, it does cover uh, some possible different development cycles um, and economic cycles that allow them to move forward, whether with support from the CRL um, or if, as you were mentioning, going without it. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm still not on side with the five years. Okay, thanks very much. Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. What are the uh, risks if uh, this does not get improved, approved? Councillor, could you clarify risks for who? Sure. Um, so is there, let me, let me put it this way. Is there a risk to the city uh, if this does not get uh, approved? Um, if you want me to expand on the question, I can, but. I, I, I think we have zoning in place right now. Um, it, it just means they wouldn't be allowed to uh, operate a parking lot there. Um, they still have the development rights for the overall development and could still proceed uh, with that. I don't know if that's helpful. Right. So no, no real risk to the city, but. Um, I guess what I'm trying to suss out is if this does not get approved, that does not necessarily mean that you will see that the city will see any more rapid development on the development. Uh, it will probably still continue at the same pace because the same conditions apply. The only difference is there's not a parking lot. Do I have that clear? I think that's correct. And I believe the applicant um, said the same thing in, in their yeah. questions as well. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you so, were, we could take yeah. a real case study here uh, just north of the parking lot there's a piece of land that's owned by a different landowner that is not uh, that is fenced off currently and it's been fenced off since early 2004 uh, when the original zoning was passed uh, for some multi-unit residential in the area so I think just in terms of uh, that risk or the risk to the city that if this is approved that development will occur slowly um, or more slowly, sorry, uh, is not there. And you anticipated my next question, which was uh, talk to me about the precedents. So there we are. Okay, um, I think I've got enough information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Councilor Paquette. Uh, so I'm not seeing any further questions from the board at this time. So we can go uh, questions related to new information. Anyone has any? Oh, Councillor Knack. Uh, yeah, thanks, Councillor Salvador. Just to, to the uh, applicants, um, wanted to ask, uh, as, as you know, uh, I, I haven't necessarily supported the, this uh, parking lot over the years, um, but, but I'm appreciating what I'm hearing uh, over the, throughout the conversation, but I also appreciate what I've heard from the community. And so I, I've, I've been going back and forth and I, I know you know, in an ideal world, you want five years. I'm hearing from the community a, a strong desire for, for a number of what I would consider very valid reasons of, of consideration more towards a shorter term. So three years or give or take March 31st, 2027. And, and while I know you would probably not want that in an ideal world, I wanted to ask your thought on that uh, if you were given a three year extension uh, versus a, a five or I guess a you know, five year extension. So I don't know if that goes to Mr. Shipton or Ms. Uh, so, sorry, thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, I, I think we've, we've brought forward, hopefully, uh, um, given you the information to lay out the things that we need to do to continue with this development. I would just say, um, you know, every day that, you know, we're meeting with bankers and lawyers and consultants and accountants and developers and on and on it goes. And the conversation is not about uh, more parking. Mm -hmm. The conversation is about developing in the downtown core and building off 
what we've done uh, in phase one, um, which has been built uh, in record time compared to any other sports and entertainment district uh, in North America here in Edmonton, Councillor, yeah. right here in Edmonton, right in downtown Edmonton. And so I think we hope we've uh, built up some credibility over time to, you know, come to this table um, and, and talk about the amount of time that we need. Uh, if we can develop sooner, uh, certainly we would. Um, those lots and that land when it was acquired uh, was not intended to be parking for the rest of the time. And I know you're, you're uh, debating um, illegal lots. Our lot is not illegal. It's regulated. It is temporary. We would prefer five years. And so it's, it's difficult for us to say we can live with three. I think our position as it stands today, Councillor, is that you know, we're asking for that five-year extension and we've been making that commitment to develop this land. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I just, I wanted to ask because it's something that I, I'm reflecting on based off all of the conversation that's happened today. And uh, so I wanted to give you a chance to respond before I considered doing an amendment to because I, I didn't think it'd be fair to not ask you that question first. So uh, really appreciate your, your uh, response to that. So I think those are all my questions that I have. Thanks so much, Councillor Knack. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else on the board for uh, new information. So at this time, um, is there anyone who would like to move closure of the public hearing? Oh, Councillor Knack. Sorry, just before I do that, I guess the the uh, the, the the new new information. I'm I'm debating uh, put, potentially putting forward an amendment, and I think before we close the public hearing, I'd have to do that. Um, so right now, uh, as written, it would be December. Uh, the end of December 2028. Um, if I was looking to do a, an actual three years, give or take a few days, it'd be March 31st, 2027, and that's something I could I could do, and this would be an appropriate time to move that. Council, there is something you can do because you'd be reducing the impact. Yeah, and there, we wouldn't have to re-advertise or anything like that to be able to go. No, nope, so. the applicants are here and aware of, of what you're proposing. Okay. Uh, I I will make that amendment to make that specific change. If there's, unless Second. There's uh, great, so we have an amendment on the floor. Uh, Councillor Knack, would you like to introduce? Yeah, I've gone back and forth. Uh, so I, I mentioned, I, I didn't actually support this when it first came forward in 2016. So I, I guess you could say I didn't like parking lots before it was cool. Um, but but no, I, you know, I, I do actually really appreciate what Mr. Shipton and OEG has done specifically on this. I, I have other concerns about other things that are going on, but, but in terms of actually holding true to their words here, I've generally seen them follow through on that. And so I, you know, when, I, when I've talked with them both and listened to this discussion, I, I don't wanna vote against it for the sake of voting against it and being difficult. I don't know if that's actually a reasonable position for me to take today in particular because of the conversation that was had at Urban Planning Committee. I, I am looking for a way to make sure that there is more equitable treatments. And, and I, I use equitable on purpose in this time because this lot has been allowed to exist for longer than what we are likely to do with the other lots that we've had a conversation about. So by saying three years versus five, it's not like we're trying to shortchange this. We're actually giving them more time than what many other lots have had in, in our core. Um, and I, I actually do very much believe OEG, they are interested in getting this done sooner rather than later. I think if they can bring it, uh, everything forward in more than three, or sooner than three years, they will. But I also don't think there's harm in saying if you can't, you know, if it's really gonna take five years, if it's gonna take six years or seven years because something is unique and something has happened, that there is a significant harm in coming back to council in part because of what the community has been asking for for a long time. And so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the community on this front because, you know, I, I remember their conversation back in 2016. I remember some of these other pieces. And so I, I, I think it's fair to say three years, my time, might have stopped, I don't know. So let's let's leave it there as an introduction and happy to answer any questions. Great, uh, so any questions? I see Councillor Paquette. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Petron, you were talking about um, sort of the, the breadth and body of work that's ahead of city administration um, in working with the proponent or with the applicant. And uh, just wondering if you can talk about timelines, if that actually works um, for administration to actually get the work done. So there's there's um, the applicant has work to do in terms of um, you know construction financing, financing um, development proposals, etc. Um, there's servicing agreements, development permits, and building permits. So you know can that be done in a year? Yes, um, but that's not the entire site. This is a large site that the vision is for 2,500 units that's going to develop incrementally over. A number of years. Uh, I don't want to estimate what that is, but 10 years, 15 years. Um, you know, there's uncertainty of how fast uh, the site will develop, and we certainly recognize that there are challenges um, with developing right now in the downtown. And so, uh, whether that will change for the applicant to move quicker, you know, I, I can't speak to that. Um, but you know, from an admin perspective, we're here to work to help facilitate development to deliver more housing downtown. Okay, so on one hand, it sounds like administration can move at the speed of business if required. Um, so that's not a delay on the city side. On the other hand, there's the consideration that this is part of a very large project with multiple moving parts. And um, there is that challenge and that desire to make sure that all of those moving parts are identified and accounted for before pulling the, the lever on development. Um, is my understanding correct there? I think that's a fair assessment, Councillor Paquette. Okay. All right, so I will listen. Uh, well, it doesn't look like anyone else has any questions. So, um, Madam Chair, would it be appropriate? Oh, there we go. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great, uh, Councillor Wright for questions. Thank you. So, um, Ms. Petron, okay, you're okay. You're uncertain of of how the site will develop over time, but is there time enough to start development in the next three years? I believe so. Um, but it is dependent on a number of factors, whether that be um, expectations around servicing the CRL or not, um, where phase one is, whether it's, you know, where this parking area is located or on a different part of the site. So um, where phase one of the development is could be anywhere. Uh, it hasn't been identified yet. Okay. Um, and then maybe if I can just get your perspective on this. Um, Mr. Shipton just talked about it, it being a, you know, their vision of it being a sports and entertainment district. But I thought the focus of today's presentation, they were talking about students and seniors and family housing. Certainly phase Which one is of, of uh, ICE district is the sports and entertainment district with Rogers, uh, the towers and the, and the center that we see developed there today. Um, these lands to the north, we can maybe refer to them as Ice District 2.0, so to speak, um, which is predominantly uh, multifamily residential, small scale commercial. There's a park. Um, it's, you know, 2,500 units is, is the overall vision in terms of the number uh, of the density of the area. So um, that's. And that's what's always been proposed for this development or? More or less, yes. Um, the, re the zoning for the area was updated and approved by council in 2022. Yes, 2022. Okay. Okay, but you, but and you think just I want to just confirm by reducing this down to three years, it's realistic that something could be done to start this development within that time. Administration's position is that, you know, allowing the parking lot for five years is appropriate. Um, so could something happen on this on these lands within three years, potentially? Um, but there is uncertainty around that. And I think we heard from the applicant, they're not limiting uh, the five, you know, to, to pursue development of these lands for until five years. You know, if they can move faster, they will, is what we, I heard from the applicant earlier. 
Okay. So they wouldn't really be on side with this three years. Limit. It didn't sound that way when Councillor Knack asked the applicant. Okay. That's what I kind of got to. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I got. Uh, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Chair Salvador. Uh, so I just want to, Ms. Patron, you had said that um, I, I understood the same thing that OEG would prefer five years. But from my understanding, from the conversation we had today, even if it's March, if it does pass that it's March 31st, 2027, that does not mean that development will occur. It just means that it cannot be a parking lot after that. Is that correct? A legal parking lot after that. Correct. It's a le to 2028, there could be a parking lot there, but it could be redeveloped to something different, like to the, to the residential multi-use vision earlier. Okay. But it, changing the date does not necessarily mean development will occur any quicker. That's what I'm trying to clarify. That's correct. Okay, and then, so then after March, if this passed, then after March 31st, 2027, it could just be blank space with no development, no purpose at all until development occurred. So, Councillor, the, the base zoning still exists today, um, and it will exist if this bylaw will be approved, uh, which is the that Central McDougal uh, mixed-use village zone. Uh, so it still allows development opportunities uh, throughout. Uh, the decision today is not that, is this a parking lot and a parking lot only until 2028? Uh, the decision today is, is there an additional temporary parking lot use allowed within the zone? Uh, that'll accompany all the other uses and design regulations uh, for the other development. Uh, so it's adding the use, it's not restricting development to the parking lot itself. Right, yeah, and I think that's the point I was trying to get across. This change of the date will not necessarily make development any sooner. It will just possibly give no use to that land is the possibility if that passes, if this passes it, after that date. If the motion passes, uh, the the use cannot of that land cannot be a, a surface parking lot in its condition as outlined within the zone, um, but all of the right. other uses uh, still exist. Um, and, and what that looks like uh, is defined by the zone. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Principe. Um, we are at our 3.30 break, um, and I suspect there will be some folks who want to speak to this item. Um, unless I'm mistaken, <laughs> look around the room. <laughs> yeah, so why don't we pause for 15 minutes and um, we'll come back to this amendment. Thanks so much, we're on recess.
We will resume and I'll just uh, begin with a roll call of council members. Make sure we're all back. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Prince Pay. Hello. Hello, Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Tang. Councillor Tang? Okay, maybe she'll join us in a bit. Uh, Mayor Sohi is away. Um, Councillor Hamilton? Hello. Hello, Councillor Rutherford? Hello. Hello, um, Councillor Cartmel? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Rice? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Jans. Councillor Jans, are you with us? Uh, and sorry, Councillor Tang, did you join? Good uh, yes. Oh, good sorry. afternoon. Okay, good afternoon. And I see Councillor Jans is on as well. Perfect. Uh, so looking to the board here, uh, Councillor Paquette, are you on for questions or speaking to? Uh, speaking. Councillor Wright, questions or speaking to? Speaking to. Great. Um, Councillor Paquette, please go ahead for speaking to the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Jans made it right in time because if he wasn't with us, he would be against us. So glad to see you with us. Um, this is an intriguing motion. Uh, I can understand it. There's a lot of uh, reasons to support it. Uh, the first of which is that it is responsive to what we heard from representative from the community who said that three years they could support, five years might be a stretch, and that after three years there would be no support. So I get that. Um, the problem is, is that if that were to happen, uh, that means th there would be no impetus or push uh, to actually move forward on construction because that is going to take its own timeline. So that's a challenge. So then not only would you not have a parking lot, which is almost the lowest common denominator of land use, but uh, you would have the next lowest common denominator, which is no utility whatsoever, an empty lot. So that is a bit of a challenge. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think speaks in favor of this is that maybe it applies some pressure. Maybe it moves the wheels a little bit faster, but we've heard really clearly that that's not going to be the case. Um, I don't think that uh, the applicant is averse to making money. In fact, I think it was just reported today that uh, the Cates organization has amassed a further $700 million uh, in this year or last year. So I don't think that that is the holdup. And um, I also understand that council would love to see development. Uh, this council has invested millions upon millions upon millions of dollars into the downtown, as has the last council and the council before that. Um, and we would like to see some return on that investment through uh, further investment from our city building partners. Um, I get that. Empty lots, parking lots, these are not ideal to a thriving downtown. Fortunately, I don't think that this motion actually accelerates that. And in fact, we may just end up with another application to extend at the end of those three years. And at that point, it could be an acrimonious conversation um, about which that council in, in its day will not be able to do anything about except either extend or not extend. That would be the actual result there. So not the greatest result. Now, I am all for holding every entity in this city accountable when they need to be held accountable. In this case, unfortunately, there is nothing to do except uh either allow this allow it for, for five years allow it for three years or um not allow it at all but the end metric doesn't change um we know that we do have a conversation coming up where uh we will see some management of uh parking lots and that will actually make a difference so while i emotionally and um, symbolically uh, absolutely support this motion uh, in every way. 
in practical terms, I fear that it doesn't really uh, do much. I know someone's going to come on and show me where I'm wrong, which I'm looking forward to. Um, but I think the only pressure involved here is an emotional one, um, uh, somewhat of a financial one if there has to be a reapplication. But otherwise, when we're talking about the grand scheme of things and uh, how large this development is and what it's going to mean to the downtown, um, I do believe that uh, a little flexibility is is required. Three years may be the flexibility, according to Willow Council. I think that uh, that is fair, but I also think that five years is also fair, all things considered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate Councillor uh, Nack's attempt to try to find a compromise and and um, consider uh, what what the community is, is looking for in the three years. I think we've heard loud and clear from the proponents that um, this isn't something that they would want to accept and they are looking at the five-year timeline. Um, so for that reason, I, I can't support the amendment, although I, I do appreciate it being put on the floor. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, this this is a really tough one. This is a, a difficult conversation, and I really appreciate all the the perspectives that have been brought forward today. Um, and I don't think there is a, a perfect outcome here. Um, I think it's it's very clear that um, you know development is proceeding um, at a certain pace, and the presence or absence of the parking lot um, doesn't doesn't really factor into that. I think we have seen this applicant. Um, redevelop swaths of, of surface parking lot. Um, so I, I, I think there is that, that proven track record. Um, and I'm not convinced that a, that a vacant lot is, is any better. I do think that I will support this amendment, however. Um, I think that there are a few reasons why, why three years feels a bit more comfortable for me. Uh, the first is that there's a great opportunity to check in on meaningful progress towards the development goals. Um, I think having this check-in um, uh, a few years subsequent to when we first passed the rezoning is really useful. It's, it's helpful to know uh, what steps have been taken um, and the work that's gone towards um, advancing that vision. I think that three years is also an important reflection of the impact that the pandemic had. Um, that was a three-year blip um, that continues to have ripple effects, but but certainly, um, you know, was a chunk of time that would have derailed any redevelopment plans, and particularly for a site uh, of this size. I think also we heard very clearly from community um, a, a stronger level of comfort with three years, and so that's something that that I also heed. So, all told, you know, I think the cautions of my colleagues are are good ones. I think that it is possible that in three years' time we would be considering, or the council of the time would be considering um, this this type of application again. Um, however, they would be doing that armed with further knowledge about the progress that's been made and what what the reasonable expectations for development are at that point. Um, again, it could be that at that point we have greater clarity and maybe it's a longer timeline um, and that, that suggests other improvements or, or change the, the use of the land. So for all those reasons, recognizing that uh, it's it's not a perfect uh, approach, it, it is an amendment that I uh, support and um, appreciate the mover bringing it forward. Okay, thanks, Councillor Stevenson. Um, Councillor Jantz. Um, I... I'm torn. I, I would prefer not to not to support this in its entirety, but I mean, I think three years is certainly better than five. I think Councillor Stevenson makes a good point about having the check-ins and the ability to reevaluate here. I guess where I'm struggling is, you know, we administration has told us we have a lot of parking downtown. We are not short on surface parking downtown. And I can think of an example here where there's a small um, mom and pop, if you will, parking lot on uh, an infill site um, that was uh, closed down because it was an illegal parking lot. And I recall speaking to a, uh, a, an 
owner, neighbor, whatever that said, you know, why am I not allowed to put up a parking lot? Why am I not allowed to get money off the parking lot until my development conditions are 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 such that I want to build? And and I think it's uh, it again is is uh, I'm worried about precedent. I'm worried about consistency. I'm worried about the uh, the problems our predecessors flagged for us about this this issue about um, what would happen here. And uh, if if it, it sort of goes both ways, if some of my colleagues have said the presence of the parking lot or the revenue of the parking lot is kind of immaterial to the development conditions, well, um, then it, then continuing the parking lot doesn't doesn't really make sense either. So I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm concerned about the the as as one of the communities members said the the little bit of uh, cash flow for little maintenance or the the cash flow for little maintenance can be become addictive. So I think three years is probably the 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 unfortunate compromise that we're all we'll all arrive at. So I'll I'll support the I'll support the three years, but um still sort of regretting that uh, um that we're hearing the precedent that this may send to others in the city about. Uh, what they what they can do with necessarily not the highest and best use of their land. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Um, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I've been listening to this conversation very carefully because I um, I wasn't. First of all, I, I really value the the um, commentary from my colleagues and the questions that you they've all asked um but also because i wasn't entirely i don't have my mind made up on this one um and i'm still not sure where i land on this i i feel i councillor paquette's argument really resonates with me i'll say because i think that there is a overarching concern with surface parking lots in general i think every single person has flagged that um, and I think that there's been a lot of pressure, of course, outside of this conversation and certainly not something that's being taken into account in this decision. But I, I think that there's a, you know, a desire generally to see uh, parking lots become the surface parking lots that do exist, making sure that they're all properly permitted and, and, and legal. Um, and so, I, you know, um, this is one I, and I, I think I've been part of this conversation. This is the third time, perhaps, that, that I've been part of this conversation. I think perhaps it's... Um, it, uh, I wonder if... So we're talking about a delta in this amendment of two years. And I don't know if two years uh, to Councillor Paquette's point will, will make a big difference. And I also perhaps find my, like I, I'm also going back to, does this help us solve the, the, um, the, the external issue here that might be um, the, the external issue I'll say regarding the um uh, legality of other surface parking lots. So if, if there's no such thing as precedent precedent at, at public hearing, so I'm, I'm spitballing a bit here, but, you know, I think I, on one hand, we have an applicant who is, um, you know, trying to operate within sort of the rules of the city. And to Councillor Jan's point, I think it's well made. Um, you know, there's there's a concern about fairness but I would also offer that there's a concern about fairness in general. If you have people who are, or, or um, other operators who've been operating a, a parking lot outside of any kind of permitting whatsoever, what is the incentive for them to start to look at trans transforming those lands or transforming their, um, uh, their practices um, if, you know, it will take them five years and to to transform that practice and and council is not willing to allow that. So I'm I'm wondering if um, you know, I think we might be being hard on the issue, the right issue, 
but I don't know if this is the proponent to demonstrate that on. So I'm like, I'm sort of talking myself through this. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm not inclined to support the three years. I don't think it'll be the end of the world, but I think that it would be wise for council to demonstrate that we're open to having the conversation when it comes to sort of transforming some of the vacant lots in our city um, and, and working within the timelines so that we can make sure that everybody is um, operating within the bounds of uh, sort of their, their zones that they're, they have proper development permits for, or, or land use considerations for what they're actually using, doing on their land. So I'm not inclined to support this, but um, I just thought, you know, we might reframe this a little bit in our own minds um, for what we want the outcome to be of the larger conversation around parking. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, Councillor Knapp to close. Uh, thanks, Councillor Salvador. Thank you. For the, uh, appreciate the, the thoughtful conversation uh, on this. You know, I have a few thoughts. So we, uh, it was, I think, May 2022 that we made a decision at this table to uh, reduce the length of time that this parking lot could operate. Originally, the proposal had come forward to December 31st, 2025. We changed that to 2023 so that we could have a, a check-in and, and a thoughtful conversation, which, in fact, we have done. So uh, this is actually really good. Uh, as I uh, appreciate that it also uh, occasionally can be frustrating for both the uh, proponent, but, but also those uh, from the community. Um, part of why I'm, I, I've settled on this is I, I, when I reflect on it as somebody that hasn't supported this idea since the beginning, I, I'm, I'm trying not to just vote no for the sake of voting no. I don't think that's a, a responsible approach to this. And so I've been trying to really think through this. And, and as I've heard this conversation, I've, I've come away with a couple of things, which is that I actually think both what the applicant is asking for and what the community league had been asking for are both reasonable. A five year is not an unreasonable ask in the world where the pandemic has thrown everything off and inflation has thrown things off. I, I have, there, there's no, for, for me, I'm not questioning at all OEG's willingness to, to do this. I know they want to do this. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind on that. So I, I think it's very reasonable for them to ask for five years and I think it's reasonable for administration to recommend and support five years. I think that's, that's very fair. I also think it was, would have been incredibly fair had they come forward with a three-year um, agreement that also provided community benefit, which is what the community has asked for. Um, and, and so as I've reflected on two very reasonable asks on something that, that I know we all share the same end goal, um, this very much was a meet in the middle. This is not a three-year plus community amenity, which is what the community has asked for, nor is it five years. It is actually an in-between on both. It provides um, a bit more of a, an opportunity for the community to have that certainty, that, that sh more short-term certainty that I think they want to see. And, and frankly, I think, I, I would argue that they deserve after having been through these conversations, not just here, not, I mean, really throughout their entire community for a very long time. They are doing, goodness gracious, Mr. Champion has been here a, a million times. He might as well just have a chair uh, over with Ms. Petron and Mr. Pollock right now. Um, advocating for his community and and working hard. And at times I've agreed with his submissions and at times I haven't agreed with his submissions. Um, but I, I feel that this is a way to show that we we both want to allow OEG to, to do their work, to get to the point that they want to, while also just putting a little bit of uh, more certainty for the community, for, for a community that is working very hard on their revitalization efforts. So. Um, no, this won't solve every problem. And I, you know, Councillor Hamilton's points were excellent. This is not gonna solve all the problems. This is not, I don't, and to Councillor Paquette's points, this will not put more pressure on them. This is not suddenly gonna speed up their redevelopment. The market will determine that. But because of all of that, I feel that it is important to give the community a little bit here in this, in this conversation to show that, you know, while we haven't always uh, agreed with them and while we haven't always given uh, the Central McDougall Community League what they've wanted uh, to, to at times their frustration, I feel that this has been a reasonable ask they've produced for us. Um, even the fact that Mr. Champion had said here today that, that, you know, he was being quizzed around, well, why not one year, right? Because that actually would have been unreasonable in my mind with my, the greatest respect to my colleagues who suggested it. Um, uh, 
And he himself said, no, I'm trying to find a way forward on this to be thoughtful, to be considerate. And so in my mind, this is a considerate middle ground on an item that we all want to reach at the same conclusion on. And it gives the opportunity for whoever's on the next council to have a look a little earlier in their term uh, if by chance something has to be extended. And hopefully that won't be because we all want to see that development. So maybe this uh, will have that opportunity to see a different story then. So. Uh, upon further reflection, instead of just voting no, I thought let's let's put forward a three-year. In fact, the delta on this is exactly 21 months because it's instead of December 31st, 2028, it's March 31st, 2027. So, I think that's a reasonable compromise in my mind. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Nat. Please vote. It didn't come up for me. No. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is defeated on a tie. <laughs> All right, uh, so that amendment has been <laughs> defeated, uh, which means we go back to nothing. Um, <laughs> is uh, someone open to moving closure of public hearing? Yes, I'll move closure of public hearing. Second. Great. Um, please vote on closure of the public hearing. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Uh, that is carried. Thank you. I'll move first reading of items 313 and 314. Second. Okay, we have first reading on the floor. Uh, anyone to speak? Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Not much to say. I just want to point out that the last vote was split exactly along party lines. Thank you, Madam Chair. For those who aren't aware, Thank I'm- Thank you, Councillor Paquette. I am joking. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Okay. Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I can't vote in, in favor of this. Um, I haven't really heard any valid arguments from the proponents as to um, why we need to continue delaying this. All, all I keep hearing is market conditions aren't right. And I, ju I just don't know when when market conditions can can be right. Um, you know, we've gone through some of the lowest interest rates in the past few years. So I, I don't know if, if, if that's part of it. Um, I trying to keep emotion out of it. Um, looking back at the Oilers in their heyday back in the 80s, that's when interest rates were up, um, the highest I've ever seen. And so I just don't know what it what it's going to take for this development to occur. And I don't think that extending another five years um, is going to make it move any faster. So, um, you know, and I know there was tried to be some compromise with the three years and had the proponent um, felt that it was doable in that three years, then perhaps I would have voted in favor of that amendment, um, which I guess would have changed things. Um, but so anyhow, I, I cannot vote in favor of this. And I think that um, development just, just needs to start. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Oh, actually, Councillor Knack. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not closing yeah. this. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I wanted to jump in. So um, I, I feel like, ha you know, I just made the argument that, that I felt both um, proposals were reasonable. And so I feel I would actually be very unreasonable for me to then now vote no on this, um, uh, albeit I would have preferred to have seen three years. I think that was a, a proper compromise. Um, the market isn't going to change because this is approved or not approved. Um, and at least to their credit, as, as someone that has not supported this from the very beginning, to their credit, they're actually 
probably the only group that has followed through on their commitments to make the improvements that we've asked for. Mm -hmm. They're the only group out of all of the illegal surface parking lots that have taken steps to try to make it better. And uh, being that this is something that we're essentially gonna be asking of all of the other surface parking lots, I feel it would be very unreasonable for me to say, yes, all of the other surface parking lots, we're gonna allow you to go for five years pending you know, certain improvements, and then say to the group that has actually done the work, you're not allowed to do the same thing. So uh, as, as frustrating as it is to have to have five years now, um, uh, I, I, I wanna make sure I, I do acknowledge and appreciate the work that's actually happened to date, um, because I think it has helped us uh, somewhat inform what we're doing broadly citywide on this. So I will support this um, uh, uh, even at the five-year piece. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Nett. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I've been pretty silent on this one. I haven't asked questions of the applicant or administration. I've been listening keenly to my colleagues and clearly by my answer in the last uh, amendment vote, I was not even sure as I was making that vote. Um, but I am sure at this point that, as my colleagues have mentioned, the thing that's swaying me towards supporting this is that it is not going to change, it's not going to speed up development. I think we all want our downtown to develop. We want it to develop yesterday, um, but it's not going to speed up development. There is a uh, a lot of illegal parking lots and other parking lots. This is, a, I don't want to penalize the people that are, are going through the proper channels. They are doing some enhancements as well from a, a visual standpoint. Um, so for those reasons, I, I don't see any reason to not support the, the, uh, the, the request of us today with regards to, to extending this. Um, I do agree though that this term market conditions as, as, as Councillor um, Wright has brought up before is, is kind of thrown around a lot without a lot of context. And so I think for me, one thing um, I definitely am committed to digging into is what are those market conditions then that are gonna make it ideal and how do we get there? Because I, I've heard that with the office conversion conversation as well. And I don't know if necessarily just public subsidy is, is the answer. Um, so what do we need to do to get those market conditions so that we can get our downtown um, thriving? But in the meantime, I think having people interact with this space, having people using it um, is better than it just sitting vacant. So for those reasons, I'll support it. Thanks, Councillor Wright, or sorry, Councillor Rutherford. Um, Councillor uh, Knack, would you be able to take the chair? Or, no, sorry, uh, Councillor Stevenson. Wait, Councillor Knack. I'll Apologies. definitely take the chair. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All over the place with names. Um, yeah, so I will. I will be brief. Um, really pre appreciated the discussion today. I would have been okay moving forward with three years. Um, I am less comfortable with five. I absolutely appreciate that we all want to get to the same place. Um, we all know surface parking lots are not the highest and best use in our downtown. That's that's pretty well established at this point. And um, I saw three as a reasonable middle ground um, as was discussed by, by previous colleagues. Um, and I really would have just appreciated that check in at three years, um, especially given how how quickly things are changing in terms of uh, context in our downtown. So um, I will leave it at that so I won't be able to support this, uh, but really appreciated the dialogue we had today. And I will take the chair back. I'll return to the chair. Thank you. Councillor Jans. Thank you. There's a lot of other developments in the city that are sitting there that are fenced, that are grassed, that are uh, using a, a, a different purpose than a surface parking lot. I am still really concerned about uh, the precedent. I know precedent is not legally binding in public hearings, but it is certainly binding in political arenas in the community. And I'm really worried about a perception of uh, special treatment. And I'm worried uh, about um, answering uh, that to my constituents. And uh, yeah, I think um, um, I'm not just starting the clock from this year or last year, I'm starting the clock from quite a few years back when um, previous councillors already expressed some concern here. So I, I too could have lived with three years, but um, I, you know, um, we're, we're in one of the hottest housing markets. We are in a, a, a great time to build. And I do worry that uh, if not in this case, in others that 
um, you know, there still is that perverse incentive of revenue from parking lots that can delay or discourage any kind of other urban development. And we want to stop doing that. And yes, I might be foreshadowing tomorrow's conversation, but the problem isn't the illegal parking lots are uh, not uh, not greened or or not not aesthetically pleasing. The problem is we still are our downtown is 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 suffering from too many surface parking lots, and and we need to go to a higher and better use as as highlighted by our speakers. So I was really um, swayed by the the public speakers who came out today, or and and last hearing as well too. And I'm also concerned about the. I, I'm not using the proper term, but the community benefit contribution, the 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 lack of support that the community members would be um, also um, also the the community the community league would be receiving um, in this in this circumstance too. I think it was uh, it, it's really important when when we do have to look at conversations that are that do have a, a negative or a deleterious impact on the community that we do look at some sort of a um, some sort of a support to to better uh, uh, make the medicine go down, and unfortunately, seeing that lacking here is is also a problem. So uh, I'll be I'll be voting in opposition. Councillor Stevenson to close. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a really interesting conversation, and um, as as my colleagues have expressed, you know, I I would have much preferred a, a three-year term. I think that um, balanced a lot of, of considerations. Um, but I, I'm still not sure that that five years is totally unreasonable. Again, the, the choice that I feel is in front of us is um, a surface parking lot or a vacant lot. Um, and a vacant lot that will not be redeveloped any faster by virtue of being empty. I think that uh, what we lose in that is, um, you know, a, a, a place that uh, can help support activities that are happening in the downtown, um, that provide uh, BIA levies and revenue to the North Edge and also Chinatown, which is important. Um, I think it's also recognizing that, uh, again, there have been, been significant impacts from the, the pandemic that have pushed development timelines uh, back regardless. Um, you know, the goal is absolutely to be winnowing away uh, surface parking lots. And I think what we've, we've really learned through our conversation and research is that, you know, enforcing on all of them immediately is, is a very difficult proposition. We don't have the resources to do that. And again, not really sure that the outcomes we would achieve would be, would be a contribution, a net contribution overall. I think the discussion that we're having tomorrow in terms of a, a holistic approach is really about, um, you know, gaining improvements, physical improvements, uh, and BIA revenues in, in return for a temporary permit. Uh, this application to me is very much in line with that, that ethic and that approach. Um, and so again, well, I would have preferred to support three years. Um, I, I think relegating this to, to a vacant lot uh, in, as we wait for development to happen won't, won't improve the vitality of the area. So I will support this. It's, it's an odd uh, place to have arrived at, but again, I think we arrived at it through really rigorous conversation and discussion about the implications, and uh, and I appreciate all the, the input that we've had to get us here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. It's carried. So I'd like to move I'll second. move second reading of items 313 and 314. Second. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. I'll move consideration of third reading. Second. Please vote for consideration. 
a third. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. And I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20727 and charter bylaw 20728. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Uh, that is carried. Great. So that wraps up uh, items 3.13, 3.14, uh, which means we have nothing left on our agenda. Uh, any notices of motion, motions without customary notice, none that I'm aware of, which means